Tradune.
Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. Happy Tuesday to all of you. Hope you're all having a wonderful day so far. And if you're not, well, hopefully I can make that a little bit better somehow. I don't know. Let's hope so. Let me get this other light on over here. Forgot about this. There we go. That's a little bit better. Anyway, welcome, welcome. If any of you happen to be here for the very first time today, then uh, let me give you an extra special welcome and also introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already that a, a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. I work on dinosaur fossils. Dinosaurs are what I study, what I publish on in the scientific literature, what I dig up during the summers. Dinosaurs are what I do and what I'm here share with all of you. If you've got questions about dinosaurs or about broader topics in natural history, questions about geology, about the history of life on Earth, about extinction or evolution, or even more broadly, questions about what is science and how does science work, I'm here to answer those questions for you. That's the beauty of a live broadcast like this one, is I can actually get into your questions, answer them in real time. We can have a back and forth, a discussion. It's one of the things that makes Twitch so special here. It's the reason why I do this five days a week. I actually make my living on this platform nowadays, if you can believe that. I'm tremendously grateful for the opportunity and uh, yeah, the kind of science outreach we get done here to my own homer, horn or anything, but it's 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 pretty cool. It's pretty special. Especially when I'm out in the field, actually digging up dinosaurs. Live, out in the, the badlands of the Rocky Mountain West. I got a text message just before stream today from, uh, from Ethan. Ethan Cowgill, whom I was digging with in Wyoming. He was our, our crew leader out there in... Uh, the late Cretaceous Almond Formation of Western Wyoming this past year. Uh, he said, Danny, we're uh, we're getting geared up to be there for like pretty much the entire month of June, which I'm very, very excited about. So uh, stay tuned for some more Fieldwork live streams there. It's going to be excellent. So yeah, yeah. Distinction is no shame, no sign of disgrace or fate. Grapefruit. In fact, in a world full of changing environments and occasional catastrophe, all species eventually become extinct. Thanks it's true, Cratefruit. Work, four signs folded, Great fruit. thank you, thank you for the seven months of support. I really appreciate that. You, it's funny, you said, for your work, for science. science. That's number four on my number pad. That sound soundboard key. Flying a... Flying Ahaz, thank you for the follow, and welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Holy cow. Yeah. So, uh... Anyway, exciting stuff. Um... More field work this summer. More work in the late Cretaceous Almond Formation. We're gonna be digging up more of that Ceratopsian, which is almost certainly going to be a brand new genus or species. Probably both. Um... Exciting stuff, since most dinosaur genera tend to be monospecific anyway. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Good stuff. Yeah. And there you go, Lunas here. I don't know what tune to sing that to, but I appreciate the lyrics there. Yeah. Um, and uh, Anarcho Kennedy says, Danny, I have a very broad question. Honestly, Anarcho, that sounds more like a statement to me. <laughs> Please tell me your question. I want to hear about it. But it might take me a minute to get to it. I'm going to scroll up to the top of chat. So you've got time to type that up, that very broad question out. Let me say hello to everybody in chat. Um, do some greetings. And we've already lost the top of chat. Shoot. But Dr. Irrefutable, Golganek, Grim Deviant, Sculpin, Matt M33, Salamander, Claire Burr, I am Morvash, Dinosaur Dave, Kythe Fish, Arle. How are you doing, Arle? Welcome back. I feel like it's been a minute. Um, Bearburg, Golgan X, Gulpin, Marika937. How are you all doing? Welcome, welcome. 
Um, Claire, I hope you're having a good day. It's good to have you here, Claire, as it always is. Thank you for everything you do for this channel. Thank you for uploading yesterday's VOD to YouTube. I was looking at that, and the video looks so crisp on there. I'm so happy about that. Um, Io sat down with me the other day, and we worked a little bit on, uh, on my mirrorless camera here. She encouraged me to just fiddle with all the different settings in camera, try and eliminate some of the snow and the flicker and stuff like that that we were getting in the background. And, uh, it looks... measures better, I think. So, thank you, Ios, for that. And thank you, Claire, for, for uploading that, that bot to YouTube. Um, who else have we got? Kodali and Casey Snowart, Niffler and Science Streams. How are you doing, Valent? Welcome, welcome. And who is... What is that appended to the front of our Apatosaurus there, Science Streams? Moco made. It's, it's almost disturbing how well that fits onto the, the torso of our apatosaur there. Anyway, it's good to see you, Blint. I hope you're doing well. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Smorphosaurus. Howdy, howdy. It's good to have you here, Smorph. Uh, Baja Spencer. Hello, hello. Texas Cryptid. Good to see you. Fall Machine. Howdy. Howdy. Paleo Lord is back as well. Good to see you, Paleo Lord. I hope you're having a good day. Uh, MS Coggins. Howdy. Howdy. Uh, Stavaros says, I came into Johnny Cash. Could it get any better? I know, right? Yeah. Do you know that that's not, that's not a fake song? That's a real song that, that Johnny Cash sang off of his, uh, it was from his children's album. No less. Um... Johnny Cash, Dinosaur Song. There we go. Yeah. Uh, check that out. Dinosaurs lived a long time ago. Yep. They were terrible lizards, don't you know? Yeah, hey, Dinosaur Song. Some ate plants and some ate meat. Some ate fish and some ate beets. So yeah, people come in and they think that that song in the cold open video, like, oh, Danny made that somehow, or it's AI or something. Nope. That's the man in black himself. Uh, in 1975, the Johnny Cash's children's album. The Johnny Cash children's album. As you see here. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, who else we got? Lady Lara Croft. Howdy, howdy. Sparky Pugwash. Good to see you. Um, Dinosaur Dave says, what is the most science science and what is the least science science? I know you're making a joke there, Dinosaur Dave, but we could actually get into a discussion about the demarcation problem and things that are kind of fringe science versus actual, like, established science. That kind of thing. Darth Goof. That ontogeny there. Ontogeny. Oh yeah. Darth Goof, thank you for the 29 months of support. That is a long time, and I really appreciate it. Appreciate you keeping me here online for that long. That's excellent. Yeah. Um Ontogeny. But yeah, yeah. And how does science work? Math. Lots of math. You know, some some kinds of science don't really have a lot of math, Stavros. Sometimes the natural world is... You can try and assign numbers to it, but sometimes that creates more problems than it solves. Some things are more complicated. Are too complicated for math, really. Um, it's just the way the world works, you know? If you try and assign numeric values to them, it only complicates things needlessly and can help obfuscate what's actually going on sometimes. That might be uh, a distressing idea to some people watching, but yeah, sometimes numbers are not the answer. Sometimes. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Geoloxa says, good evening. Regards from Spain, everybody. How are you doing, Geoloxa? Welcome, welcome. Um, Buenas noches a ti, Geoloxa. Uh, it is currently 
early afternoon here in the beautiful sunny San Francisco Bay Area. But yeah, here in California, we're on a different time zone. So, makes sense, right? Um, um, Luna Seer, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Sculpin says, Godzilla review. Was it campy enough for the Godzilla genre? I don't think Godzilla films have to be campy. The original 1954 film certainly wasn't Sculpin, and I feel like this one was trying to kind of harken back to that, if you're talking about Godzilla minus one. I honestly didn't like it very much. Like, it was okay, I guess. I recognize it was a well-made film. Well-acted, well-directed. It's a good movie. It just didn't really do much for me. Um... Yeah, I didn't necessarily like its approach to Godzilla. That have ever appeared on this planet. Rusty Guy, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing, Rusty Guy. It's good to have you here. Holy cow. Um, thanks for following. All right, continuing to move through chat. Say hello to everybody. DNH, Jedi, Mega Man. And uh, Samuel Animates, Rylesy. And, oh, you know it's a real song. Excellent, Stavros. And uh, Shakespeare, I like that. I remember learning that um, that William Shakespeare himself didn't have like a standard spelling for his name. He spelled it a bunch of different ways during his life lifetime. That's probably one of those, isn't it, Shakespeare? I, uh, I appreciate you being here. Hello, hello to you. Uh, I'm going to get through the bottom of the chat, and then we'll get to Anarcho Kennedy's question. Kill it on K. Hello, hello. Say Taoshi. Yeah. There we go, Niffler. Thank you for those hundred bits. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff. Say Taoshi says sometimes a good movie can just not be your thing. Doesn't mean it's bad. Exactly. And that's that's how I felt about this. Sometimes there are bad movies that I really like, and I recognize like this is not a good movie. But man, I'm really enjoying this. This is kind of the opposite, you know? Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Uh. And is that Archaeopteryx on the wall to your right? On the wall to my right. You mean this critter? No. This is Trirarchuncus. That's the first dinosaur named. Well, we published it in 2020. It's my first new dinosaur paper. So the first dinosaur paper that has my name as an author on it, where it's a brand new dinosaur. Trirarchuncus. Yeah. Um, anyway, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I want to get to Anarcho Kennedy's question. Uh, I have a question, but it's not about life on Earth. Something has been made super interesting to me regarding the recent Perseverance mission on Mars. Is it Perseverance or is it is it Perseverance? <laughs> the recent Perseverance mission on Mars. Possibly finding signs of life in an ancient lake bed. If Mars has life in its hot years, could it have been analogous to life around the same time about 3.5 billion years ago? Simple life, that is. Um, could it have been analogous to life around the same time? Not, could it have, I mean, it would have to have been analogous, Anarcho Kennedy, yeah. Like, it would have to be at a very, um, a simple life, as we call it, you know? Probably unicellular, um, yeah, I really actually kind of doubt it. I'm not necessarily convinced that, that life is something that's, I don't know. As a paleontologist, I look at that question like, oh, how common is life throughout the universe? So far, we have a data point of one. So far, it seems like life has only ever arisen once here on Earth in billions of years. And part of that is that if life ever arose a second time, it would just very quickly be eaten by the life that already evolved. So, or the life that already arose, I mean, through abiogenesis. I don't know. I don't know. I, I kind of suspect that 
that life might require very, very specific specific circumstances to evolve or to arise in the first place. I mean, you can't evolve uh, until you're already there. So, yeah, evolution and abiogenesis are different things. Um, but yeah, yeah. Could it have been analogous to life around the same time, around 3.5 billion years ago in Ark of Kennedy? Yeah, I mean, it could have been. If Mars ever had life, it would probably... I don't know. The problem, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Could you, could you rephrase your question, maybe? Because I feel like I'm speaking way too broadly here. I feel like you might have... Uh, a more specific query, and I'm not, I don't feel like I'm getting to it. Can you rephrase your question? Um, anywho, yeah. And Flying Ahaz says, how do you perform, how do you format your notes concerning paleontology? I don't know what you're asking, Flying. Um, could you rephrase your question too? I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. How do I format my notes? mean like what kind of note-taking software do I use what kind of handwriting do I use when I write in a notebook what are you what do you ask let me know yeah um but yeah 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 and high-tech little life Fermi paradox dark forest etc uh, theories on life in the universe yeah a lot of hypotheses I don't think I'd call them theories but I might not even call them hypotheses because some of these aren't testable it, I guess, I guess, strictly speaking, they would be testable. They're just not currently testable. But yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah. <laughs> uh. But yeah. Murph, shake and bake theropod. I can't say I have, Murph. No, no. Unless you're talking about, isn't shake and bake a chicken thing? And chickens are theropods. But yeah, yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. And Sparky Pugwar says, could it have been possible that some dinosaurs could have been short-sighted, or is that something that only mammals have a problem with? Um. Short-sighted. Well, short-sightedness is different from having poor vision. And I'm not sure which one you're asking. I'm Man, I'm being really picky about the questions today. <laughs> um, short-sightedness just means that, like, your focal length is pretty short. Uh, is that the same thing as astigmatism, or is it related to that? I'm not sure. But they're, from what we can tell... Most, if not all, dinosaurs that we found would have had pretty decent vision. Better today than that of most mammals. Um, when I was talking with uh, with Balint about this, about that paper on the orbit size in dinosaurs, there we go. Orbit size and estimated eye size in dinosaurs and other archosaurs and their implications for the evolution of visual capabilities. Dinosaurs on average had larger eyes than mammals today do. Uh, larger eyes relative to their to their body size. Relative to the, the overall dimensions of the animal. And so we've got every reason to believe that dinosaurs would have been more visual than mammals today. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And Sculpin says astigmatism is nearsighted, and Cast the Dreamer says astigmatism is an oval-shaped eye. Yeah, and that might cause nearsightedness, or I'm not sure. But yeah, yeah. And Phoenix the Archaeologist says, I thought their sight was based on movement. Nope, Jurassic Park lied to you about that, Phoenix the Archaeologist. Jurassic Park lied to you about that. And here, I can show you a clip of a video I did a long time ago on YouTube. page video essays here we go here this is a 
a video that I did a long time ago. So as we were... No, from the beginning. Well, please. hey there. This is paleontologizing. I'm Danny and... Sorry, there's no closed captions. Today we've got something pretty special planned. Jurassic Park is... Oh, hang on. Sold the bull? How are you doing? Sold the bull Welcome to paleontologizing. Are about to get flattened by dinosaur content. I don't think I've seen you here before. Welcome, welcome. To paleontologizing. How are things? Sol? Is it Sol or Sol? I'm guessing it's Sol because it presumably rhymes with bull, right? Anyway. It's good to have you here. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. And, uh... I'm here on Twitch trying to do some, uh... some good old-fashioned science outreach. You know? Talking about fossils. Talking about fossil science. Answering your questions about natural history. How science works. Um... And Waika, favorite dinosaur is the rarely seen Do You Think He Saws. Yeah, Do You Think He Saws. That's a pretty well-known old joke. That's even in the film Jurassic Park, which I was just talking about. Welcome, Waika. It's good to have you here. And your favorite dinosaur is a Stegosaurus, Saldable. Well, shoot. I've got a few different printed parts of Stegosaurus here, along with a bunch of Stegosaurus emotes. There we go. And Zornop Diplodocus. Excellent favorite dinosaur, too. Welcome, welcome. Here. Any other favorite dinosaurs from the Raiders? Let me grab my Stegosaurus and Diplodocus parts. I will be right back. And uh, Zornpa, or Zornop, sorry, Zornop, thank you for the follow, welcome, welcome. Yeah, check out this juvenile Diplodocus skull, 3D printed. An adult Diplodocus skull would be easily twice as long as this. An armored giant, wreaking his prehistoric fury on modern man and his puny machine. Uh, thank you, Sol de Bull. Sol de Bull for that follow, welcome, welcome. It's paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah. Um, looks like you in the morning time? Really? You look this gaunt? <laughs> I haven't painted this one yet. Um, so it's still just in the original 3D printer filament color. But yeah, love those peg-like teeth there in the front. They're kind of nipping plant material and then swallowing it whole. So yeah, Diplodocus. And then this is a tail spike that I 3D printed of Stegosaurus. This is life-size. These guys had some pretty formidable tail spikes. And uh, this is just the bony core to it, by the way. In life, the spike would have been much longer because it was sheathed with keratin, kind of the same material as, like, your fingernails or the horn of a rhinoceros or the beak of a bird. Keratin would have been coating this whole thing, so it would have been even longer and sharper. So, uh, not the kind of thing that you want swung in your direction. I mean, just imagine this. Just... <laughs> it's... Harrowing to think about, isn't it? But that's how they would have defended themselves. Um, there are four of these on the end of the tail. Let me show you, uh, a decent Stegosaurus here. Um, there we go. That's a really excellent one. Right here. Yeah. With a baby. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. And you can see those tail spikes. 
And uh, Narlkar, Nalkar says, It's so nice to see my dream job being shown on Twitch. Shoot, wait till the summertime, Nalkar. You can watch me and my crew digging up dinosaurs in Wyoming and in Utah this year. Uh, just like last year. That's gonna be a lot of fun. There we go. Yeah. Uh, anyway, if it's your first time here on Paleontologizing, then welcome, welcome. I'm glad you could make it. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Um, you're clever folks, so you probably know already that a paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular, hence dinosaur paleontologist. And I'm here with the Utah Geological Survey, helping them dig up some dinosaurs here in this quarry. I'm going to take you over there in a couple minutes, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. First, just as some background, we're here in the very earliest Cretaceous Cedar Mountain Formation. <laughs> Rocks about 140 Dormier million. Bell, happy to see you too. How you doing? Very beginning of the Cretaceous, and uh, yeah, this is new stuff. The dinosaur that we're digging up now, an Iguanodontian, is most likely going to be a new species. We won't know for sure until we can actually get the bones excavated, brought back to the laboratory, cleaned, studied, and prepared. And yeah, yeah, but really good chance it's going to be something new. What about the ankylosaurs? Do they make it through? Is Gastonia... Pelta yeah. Seems to be so like there's Utah State yeah. Paleontologist Jim Kirkland. Uh, Gastonia and Mimor Pelta. The guy who discovered and named Utah Raptor. The animal from your side over there. Yeah. Yeah, the one, yeah, but yeah. these beds. Yeah, yeah. You know, it seems to be so with any luck, we'll be out with Jim again this uh -huh. next summer. Um, this summer. But, summer 2024. You know, overall, in like July. You know, just Campus yeah. Source. Does that evolve into... Iguanodon. Yeah, yeah, that's... You know, do they actually originate here and then go to Europe? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool, yeah. We don't know. Iguanodontians being a, an American original? Do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to get into some plastering here. For anybody who's not witnessed this in one of these streams before, you're in for a treat. Um... Anyway, if you'd like that treat, check out this link. There you go in the chat. Yeah. Uh... Um, anywho, yeah, good stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it's psyched for your daily dose of science. It's good to have you here, Dormir Bell. It's good to have you here. And hey, Rachidactylus, welcome, welcome. It's good to have you. Here, we were just getting into another quick video, because we we're going to talk about how Jurassic Park... Kind of lied to you. I say that for dramatic effect, but it's true. Well, hey there. This is Paleontologizing. I'm Danny Anduza, and today we've got something pretty special planned. Jurassic Park isn't just one of the most popular films of all time. It's also tremendously important as a cultural touchstone and as a piece of paleontological public outreach. That's important to understand. After all, as a dinosaur paleontologist, it's my job not just to dig these animals up and to study them, but also to make sure that information from my science is getting to the public. And like it or not, Jurassic Park has shaped the public's view of dinosaurs for a generation. To help explore this idea, I sat down with one of my favorite people in the world who has somehow managed to have never seen this movie before. Yeah, Today Mariel's we are never being seen joined it. by the lovely and whip-smart Marielle Colvin. Hi. <laughs> so, Marielle, despite being a native Montanan, you were born and raised in Montana, correct? Yep, uh, six generations back. Six generations, geez. And yet, you have never seen Jurassic Park, which might be... I'm trying to find the part here. I'm wrong about here. this in the comments, but that might be one of the most prominent films to ever actually feature scenes in Montana. Um, um, a river runs through it. I've never seen that. You've never seen I've it. I've never seen um, it. I would say, well, maybe it's not more prominent. I don't think it is. But it's <laughs> Enrico Dactylus. Yeah. A lot of people haven't seen it. So. Okay. Is that right? Mm -hmm. He used to be a model before he was an actor, wasn't he? I think so. Huh. Interesting. I'm not up to date on my Brad Pitt trivia. <laughs> I'm not either. But <laughs> there is one thing that I'm pretty sure about, and I'm pretty sure that most of the people watching this will be more familiar with Jurassic Park than A River Runs Through It. Not to, I'm not, <laughs> not, not sitting on that movie. Is there anybody watching 
right now who has seen the film A River Runs Through It but has not seen Jurassic Park? I still think I'm right about this. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but how, though? I know, right, Rachodactylus? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Mariel, I don't know. She's got more important things to do than, like, wallow in pop culture. Um, I respect that, you know? Yeah. Uh, never seen River at Rusty Guy? Yeah, yeah, I, I still haven't. And I lived in Montana for the better part of a decade. Uh, you've seen both multiple times this Cast the Dreamer. Okay. Which one has more dinosaurs, Cast the Dreamer? And thus, which one is the superior film? Um... <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, the question, the reason why we're watching this is we had a question, I think from, um, uh, who is this from? Well, here, let's get into this part. You know, that does lead us to another question I had during the movie. Okay, go for it. In which I asked you how well a Tyrannosaurus can smell. <laughs> Speaking of <laughs> senses... Yeah. <laughs> I want to like so make it we simultaneously there you go mayor space this was unprompted yeah. <laughs> you came up with this this is a fantastic question own. okay do you want to know the thought process behind why I go for this? it please okay so the T-Rex goes and chomps the goat and for some reason an entire leg flies off the goat where's the goat Okay. And lands yeah. on top of the car. On top of the, the Ford Explorer. The kids yes. are in. Yeah. And then the T Rex chomps down the rest of the car. Yeah. And breaks down the fence. And I wanted to know yes. whether or not the T Rex would be able to smell the extra goat leg <laughs> <laughs> that had flown off <laughs> of the goat and landed on the car. This is an excellent point. And. <laughs> And cast the dreamer. That's chances are, yes, I would <laughs> that's say a good paradigm right there. Absolutely, yes. So I've seen the original three, but not Jurassic World. You're not missing much. And like, yeah, I actually really need to reprint the. Anyway, I've got the um, the endocast of a T Rex brain, and I talk about that here in this clip. Casts of its brain, and so yeah. So, Tyrannosaurus endocast. There we go. I'll give you a link to this. So if you'd like, you can download it and print it yourself if you've got a 3D printer at home. But this is a T-Rex brain right here. If we've got a well-preserved skull, we can often CT scan that. CT scan the brain case. The kind of bony case surrounding the brain and then determine what shape the brain was. How big the different parts were. And uh, it gives us a good sense for like the biology of the animal. What are its senses like? So here we've got the inner ear. The semicircular canal of the inner ear responsible for balance and everything. And the actual orientation of this right here tells us like what is the comfortable like neutral position for the animal to hold its head in where it feels well balanced. So you can actually tell what angle a dinosaur held its head at um, based on the angle of these parts of these semicircular canals, which is really neat. Andy Aspian says, I have a question, Danny. That, see, to me, that sounds like a statement, Andy Aspian. That sounds like a statement. I'm just kidding. What's your question? Um, anyway, these protrusions here are the various nerves. So there's the vagus nerve. There's the hypoglossal nerve. There's the ophthalmic nerve. This one actually goes to the eyeball right here. And so these would extend out further, but they've been truncated here. They've been cut off so that you can see the brain itself. And then up here, we've got the olfactory bulbs, which are gargantuan. This is responsible for smell. So like this here is responsible for vision as the ophthalmic nerve. This is responsible for smell. It's absurdly huge. So Tyrannosaurus would have had uh, an incredible sense of smell. Just absolutely stellar. But uh, yeah, yeah. And how do you fit a dinosaur into a CT scanner? Well, they tend to come apart when they're skeletons, Andy Aspen. So like a Tyrannosaurus brain case, you know, tends to just kind of slot right in. 
it's, it'll be like this big. Um, yeah. Here, let's take a look at... Trying to find you a decent video here that'll actually be helpful. Hmm. I guess let's do this one. Although I might have to reverse the footage, because it is, is it is from BBC Studios. So apologies if you're watching later on on YouTube. So yeah, this is Willow. The little dinosaur with a heart. Um, yeah, a Thessalosaurus specimen at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And uh, it was rumored to have had a fossilized heart inside, but that's no longer really accepted by most paleontologists. Hyacinth Live! Uh, hello? <laughs> Hyacinth Live! Thank you, thank you for the raid. Welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? It's good to have you here. Howdy, howdy. Uh, deep sea raid indeed. How are things down in the deep sea? Probably very dark and very cold. Very high pressure, I would imagine. It's good to have you here. If any of you are new to Paleontologizing, then uh, I'd like to give you an extra special welcome. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. A paleontologist is a fossil scientist, as you probably know already. But if you didn't, then there you go. I, uh, I work on dinosaur fossils in particular, hence dinosaur paleontologist. And I'm here on Twitch talking about dinosaurs to whoever will listen. So if you've got any questions about dinosaurs or about the history of life on Earth in general, about the fossil record, about extinction or evolution, or the very philosophy of science. Do not hesitate with those questions. That's what I'm here for. It's good to have you. Um, but yeah, dark and cold, but full of life. We are watching a... Oh, a live dive. Very cool. Was that uh, maybe with Imbari or something? Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute? I'm going to the Monterey Bay Aquarium in February or March. I forget, but very excited to go back. It's one of my favorite places in the world. Um, good stuff. Yeah. And, uh, anyway. Yeah. And Dr. Terra has requested Gargoyleosaurus. Dig up, dig up dinosaurs? And we've got another raid from Geo Jim. This is brilliant. Oh. I do really appreciate Geo that. 2006 and their five raiders want to know what it's like. Thank you, thank you, Geo Jim. <laughs> Welcome back. How did your stream go? I hope it was really good. Excellent. We've got a raid from Geo Jim, and we've got a raid from Hyacinth Live. Tell me how both of your streams went. I'd love to hear about it. Geo Jim, what kind of wonderful geological topics were you discussing today? Let me know. Welcome back to Paleontologizer. It's good to have you here. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, and TK says, you may be cool, but are you eating dinner inside a dinosaur fossil cool? Are you talking about the famous dinner in the Iguanodon, TK? That happened 170 years ago. A couple weeks ago. Um, famous dinner in the Iguanodon. That was New Year's Eve, 1853. 1854? 1854. Um, there we go. There's a decent image right there. Yeah. Good stuff. And TK says, yes. Yeah, we did a big special stream about this on New Year's Eve. Um, I happen to have a 3D print of the original Iguanodon model. Um, which I could get out if 
I didn't have too many other things going on right now. We're already in the middle of three different tangents. But, uh... Yeah. Geogym says, fun stream. Talking about a Triassic fossil site I was at this weekend. Very cool, Geogym. Very cool. Triassic fossil site. And you're on the East Coast, right? This wouldn't be where Ankysaurus came from, would it? Ankysaurus polyzelus, which I... Or, or maybe Podokasaurus, which I think has become the state fossil of um, Massachusetts. One of the rift basins here in Virginia. Oh, very cool, Geo Jim. Very, very cool. That's awesome. And Dormir Bell says the ADHD nature of this channel is one of the reasons I love it. I don't, I don't actually have ADHD, but I I know a lot of people who do. I bounce around to a bunch of different topics because I'm trying to be responsive to what everyone here is interested in. And I get very excited about what you're interested in. And that inspires all kinds of tangents and all kinds of stuff like that. So I'm glad that works for you, Dormir Bell. I'm glad that works for you. I'm glad you appreciate it. Case in point, what's this right now? Dinosaur. Got some good hearing there. Uh, Nihil MD, how are you doing? Uh, it's good to have you here. Yeah. Anyway, very cool. And Trooper says, I missed the New Year's stream. Where can I see it? On YouTube, Trooper. Um, or on Twitch also. But let me show you the YouTube page. There we go. Let's go to videos, and uh, one month ago, let's see, that should be, yep, Dinosaur New Year, here it is here, and there's my Megalosaurus 3D prints right there. Right there, and there's the original Megalosaurus jaw. There's an Iguanodon behind me right here. There's Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, who did the uh, the original Crystal Palace dinosaur sculpts. Yeah. Good stuff. Anyway. Uh, but there you go, Trooper. Yeah. And I have seen Godzilla Minus One, but I haven't seen it without color, Dr. Terra. Interesting. Is it discounted because there's no color? <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's good to have everybody here. We appear to have some new viewers here for the very first time. If you are here for the very first time, if you just came in with one of those raids, would you like to see a welcome video? If you came in with Hyacinth Live or Geo Gym, if you did, give me a one in the chat. I'm kind of uh, leaning toward no, but. And TK, thank you for the follow. Uh, oh, Nihil's given a one. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Well, TK, with a one? Flying house? Well, well, well. I'm going to call forth a good friend of ours. We call him Previously Recorded Danny, and he's going to tell you a little bit about this channel, about who I am, what my background is. I'll just give you my message up front. Try not to go extinct. That's good advice there, gotcha. Freedom Fallout. <laughs> That's my old boss, Jack Horner, whom you're about to meet in this video, along with, hang on, I'm just getting to you. Along with previously recorded Danny, who is, uh, well, he's going to take center stage right now and tell you what this channel is all about. Thank you again for those raids, Geo Jim. And Hyacinth, I really appreciate it. And to all you new folks, um, I'll leave you in the very capable pre-recorded hands of previously recorded Danny. Take it away. Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you're new here, then uh, welcome to paleontologizing. You might be wondering to yourself, uh, where's the video game? Well, my name's Danny Anduza, and I'm a paleontologist. I don't really do too much in the way of video games, I guess. I work on dinosaurs.
But how does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, I'll tell you. It all started when I moved to Montana right out of high school. In my first week there, I started working at the Paleo Lab at Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was probably the greatest dinosaur museum on the planet. If you've ever seen any of the Jurassic Park movies, then you're more familiar with that institution and with my old boss than you may realize. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said that the guy, Alan Grant, was you. Yes, yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> it was in that program that Jack Horner built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. I learned a lot of that from Jack Horner's last graduate student, this guy, Denver Fowler, who would go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in North Dakota. Under Denver, I did nearly a decade's worth of field work digging at hundreds of sites on the Upper Cretaceous, excavating literally hundreds of dinosaurs. Here's just a few highlights. In 2012, I discovered the world's oldest specimen of Chasmosaurus, hopefully soon to be published as a new species. In 2017, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. I've also been lucky enough to help collect another very important specimen, the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. And much like my fieldwork, my research is also centered on dinosaurs. Some of that deals with new genera and species, like this guy, Truarchuncus, a bizarre little theropod from the very end of the age of dinosaurs, who was just published in July of 2020. I've got a few studies in the works right now, some of them focusing on dinosaur biogeography, and some others on behavioral functional morphology, basically looking at bizarre features of dinosaur skeletal anatomy and trying to figure out why those features evolved. And one of my current projects involves spinosaurs, but I can't really talk about that until it's closer to publication, so uh, don't ask me about it yet. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things were definitely on the decline in Montana, so I packed up and moved back to the West Coast, and I have been so much happier here. I've also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-deadening bureaucracy within academia. So for the time being, anyway, I've moved my career in a different direction. And lucky for me, it happens to pay a lot better, too. I kind of stumbled my way into a job in early childhood education. I get to make a real difference in kids' lives and help instill a love of nature and a burning curiosity for the world around them. Then coronavirus descended and the school shut its doors. But I wasn't about to let a global pandemic stop me and my students. We just moved online. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt. With just a pick and brush, of finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things, like Velociraptor's jumps or Archaeopteryx's wings, and all the kids who want to see them line it up at a home museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. Having made the jump to teaching remotely, it was only a short leap from there to Twitch. I started streaming in May of 2020, and it's been tremendously rewarding. Now, it's my belief that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about your science is one of the most important things a researcher can do. Twitch is kind of an ideal medium for that. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. 
And if you could help out by continuing to watch, or if you can afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So, for my regular viewers, thank you for sitting through that again. And uh, for everybody who's new, welcome. We've got a fantastic little community going here, and uh, we'd be really happy if you'd join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to Hyacinth Live and Geo Jim for your raids. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Nothing Bout, for the four months of support there. At that time, the land of the planet was um, together in one vast super Check that out. And Lad12, thank you for your follow. Soon occupied Welcome, Lad12. Of that world. Yeah. Um, Congrats for meeting your partner, Sub Goal. It is a topic that I'm usually very interested in, but this has easily become one of my favorite streams lately to watch late at night. So you deserve all the success. Thank you, nothing about. I and really it's appreciate. It's likely that we're here words. today because, and the support by the luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary times got felled in a mass extinction. Raw. And casually average. Thank you for the eleven months right there. Holy cow! Excellent. A dinosaur? What? And hyacinth left. What? <laughs> Thank you for that follow. Kite Fish, 100 bits there. Thank you for that support, Kite Fish. Appreciate those bits. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. Anyway, so that's that's me with that that welcome video. One of these days, I'm gonna be making some new welcome videos with some new footage, kind of updated from that, because I no longer teach full time. I've gone back to teaching part time on the weekends. Um, but I've switched to. Twitch full time, and this is what I do. This is actually how I make my living, believe it or not. And uh, that partner plus revenue increase is going to help tremendously. Anakin Gabriel. Science is for the cool kids, cold cart. It's true, Anakin Gabriel. It's true. Thank you for the four months of support. I really appreciate that. I really do, Anakin. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. So yeah, yeah. But yeah, since I made that video, I've done a bunch of fieldwork live streams. So like, when I go out and dig up dinosaurs during the summer, out in the in the remote, thirsty badlands of Wyoming and Utah, I was able to bring this audience along last summer by using satellite internet going to do the same thing again this summer for knowing what dinosaurs looked like we now need to know how they lived there you go mistrictian you're worth it <laughs> thank you mistrictian thank you very very much i appreciate that it's good to see you again by the way how are you yeah 31 months that is almost the whole year isn't it claire burr yeah holy cow uh good stuff good stuff but yeah that's me. Um, good stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, and uh, Nihil MD says, "Awesome intro video. My how very apparent how enthusiastic you are about this. I mean, this is this is what I do. This is what I was born to do." Nihil. Torn meniscus. Oh, oh, Mastrichtian. That's not great. Otherwise, I'm good. Okay, glad to hear that. Mommy does says that right now she's battling COVID. Um, Lordy is also battling COVID right now. Since we live in the same house, I'm trying not to not to get it. Also, so far so good. But we'll see. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and flying has no. You're great. Ask your question again. Sorry, I missed it the first time. Yeah. Uh. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah, if you were to study paleontology, what approach is the most fun to start with? Their physiology, fossils, land origins. Hope this is more specific. Oh yeah. Uh, flying has it. It depends what you're interested in. 
That's a very personal question. So it's like, if you're looking into getting started in paleontology, so much of... Well, here, let me put it like this. There are roughly as many different ways to be a paleontologist as there are different paleontologists. There are some paleontologists who have a background in, like you were saying, physiology. There are some paleontologists who have a background in computer modeling or in uh, animal biomechanics. There are some paleontologists who got into paleontology from engineering or from mathematics or from computer science or from physics or from geology or biology, zoology, chemistry. There are paleontologists who just study fossilized dung. Literally figuring out what ancient animals ate by looking at their fossil poops. Like, that's really important stuff. There are paleontologists who... They just specialize in fossil trackways. Fossilized footprints. There are paleontologists who... Study specific groups of organisms. Paleobotanists will study fossil plants. And there are paleobotanists who will just study a specific subgroup of fossil plants, and they'll make that their whole career. There are paleontologists who only study marine reptiles, or fossil mammals, or fossil birds. I think the, the best way to think about paleontology is to recognize that it's an extremely broad science. Mommy does. Thank you for those 21 months there. Now at tier 2, that is stellar, and I appreciate it, Mommy does. Thank you for helping us get to our Partner Plus goal. Holy cow. That's excellent, and I hope you feel better, by the way. I really do. I hope you're taking care of yourself. You're resting up. Drinking plenty of, plenty of water. Yeah. My irresponsible sickbed spending? Well, you know I appreciate that, Mommy does. I really, really do. Thank you for, uh, for supporting my mission of science. science outreach here on the good old interwebs. I appreciate that, Mommy Does. I really do. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Dinosaur diseases sound metal now that I think about it. Yeah. Flying has, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Sparky Pugwar says, I would want to study fossil plants. They look super interesting. Oh, they are. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, here, I wonder if I can find you a video about, um, this is, no, oh, hang on. <laughs> Mommy does, thank you for those five gifts of, you did not have to do that, but I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Look, we are... Mommy, does DPS really want to 69 out of 100? Five gift nice. Subs. Um, Mommy does. Thank you, thank you for those five gift subs. We are... This sub goal was supposed to last us until Friday. And look, it's Tuesday, and we're already more than halfway done. That's excellent. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, here, let's... Let's take a look at what YouTube has to say about what is a paleontologist. What does a paleontologist do? Dig into paleontology. Educational shorts. Oh boy, some of these are gonna be lousy, but some of these are gonna be, are gonna be good. Um, this one's gonna be good, because it's from SciShow. SciShow Kids. It's gonna be a little, a little too upbeat, a little too chirpy. We're gonna watch it anyway. I think this will be decent. Rawr. Oh, hey guys, we're just practicing our best dinosaur roars. If you met my friend wow. Daniel before, then you probably know he's crazy about dinosaurs. He loves going to museums to see- He is, a, I mean, if he's a bird, then he legitimately is a dinosaur. Why is he wearing this stuff? He is a dinosaur. Birds are, literally are dinosaurs, you know? Yeah. Their bones, reading books about them, and even pretending to be them. Wouldn't it be cool if you could spend all day thinking about dinosaurs, trying to figure out things like what? It is pretty cool, I gotta say. You know, I'm. 
I'm not gonna I'm not gonna downplay and go, you know what, it's really not that great being able to think about the thing that you're most passionate about all day long when it is the coolest thing in the world. And uh you know, it's it actually is legitimately really cool. What did they look like or what did they eat and do they like to play too? For some people, their job is exactly that. But this special group of scientists yeah. doesn't just study dinosaurs. They learn about all kinds of things that lived a really long time ago, including reptiles, yeah. mammals, plants, and even teeny tiny bacteria. These scientists True. are called yeah. paleontologists. And I, I really like that, that she made that distinction there where paleontology is not just dinosaurs because the vast majority of paleontologists do not study dinosaurs. We study all kinds of, of fossils. Paleontology is the study of fossils to learn about prehistoric life. Dinosaurs are just, you know, the tip of the iceberg there. Um, unlike on an iceberg, that probably is the coolest part, you know, is dinosaurs. Um, even though they are just the tip of the iceberg. Does that analogy make any sense? I don't know. Anyway, I want to emphasize the fact that Paleontology is much, much more than just dinosaurs, even if dinosaurs sometimes get the majority of the attention, you know? Yeah. Is that the SciShow theme song? Just a rework up? That's actually clever, and I, I like that. probably noticed that the kinds of dinosaurs that you see in museums aren't alive anymore. I mean, you don't have to worry about bumping into T-Rex at the grocery store. That's because... Uh-oh. What's wrong with this T-Rex depiction, chat? Hmm, whoever made this didn't quite get it right. Okay. A few things is clever. Yeah, too many fingers. The wrists aren't really correct. Yeah, you guys are clever. Holy cow, I'm impressed. Tyrannosaurus has two fingers on each hand. Um... So yeah, that part's not right. That's because missing they're lips is They died out millions of years ago. So for paleontologists to do their job, they have to look for clues. And Calamir, we don't know if adult Tyrannosaurus would have had feathers. We still don't know about that. Yeah. The dinosaurs and other extinct animals left behind. Luckily, they left us plenty of clues. The they're yeah. fossils. Fossils are the remains of animals and plants from long ago that slowly became preserved in rocks. And I'm I'm picking nits at a granular level here, but it's not just animals and plants. It's also fossil fungi, fossil protists, fossil organisms would have been a, a better way to put that. But this is a video aimed at kids, and so, yeah, at least they included plants, you know? Fossils can be of animals' bones, teeth, and shells or the imprints of old leaves. Or they can be rocks that hold other clues to what life was like in the past, like an animal's footprint or even their fossilized poop. Paleontologists use yeah. all of these kinds of fossils to find out more about the history of life on Earth. For example, they've learned about extinct trees and flowers that lived millions of years ago. They found bones of some of the earliest known- Okay, this is cool, but I feel like... It might not be the right kind of vibe for this channel because, I don't know, you know this already, and that's aimed at kids, so, yeah, good video for kids, I'll give you a link, but, uh, yeah, let's go back here and... Take a look at the a day in the life of paleontologist Thomas Carr. So I've I think very briefly done field work with Thomas Carr. Despite popular culture and the public image, paleontology can be difficult, unglamorous, and at times seemingly boring. But with a good dose of patience, like that, paleontology though. can be rewarding, fun, and very exciting. Carthage yeah. College paleontologist Dr. Thomas Carr, along with student crews and Museum Curator of Education Chris DeSantis, have traveled out to the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. And Phoenix Archaeologist has lots of administrative work. I mean, it depends. It depends what kind of job title you have. 
Oh. And thank you, thank you, Mommy Does, for those 200 bits. Appreciate that very much. Thank you, thank you. Excellent. Luckily, I've got little to no administrative work uh, doing what I do as a paleontologist. But man, if I worked as a professor at a university, or if I worked in a museum, there might be a lot of grant proposals that I would have to write, a lot of administrative meetings, stuff like that. Um, but that's more of an academia problem than it is a paleontology program problem. But yeah. This yeah. short film captures part of their real life search for dinosaur fossils and shares what a day of paleontology is really like. Nice. Paleontology is the scientific study of life in the geologic past, especially through the examination of animal and plant fossils. We have been waiting a full year to go back. To go about understanding fossils, we need to first dig them up out of the ground so that we can study them. Normally, this is a very long and tiring process, but lucky for you, I've been able to join Dr. Carr and his Carthage <laughs> student crew on a few digs, so the hard work is this already is in done. Carter County, Montana, and in this short Eagle film, Echo. we will share some of the experiences we go through on a typical dig. Now we can finally get onto the field. Let's this is it. this is a very significant moment for us, because we can actually do what we've been waiting to do for a year. Yeah, I've been here before. I think that. They're probably in either Baker or Miles City, Montana, at the BLM office, the Bureau of Land Management office, picking up their permits so that they can go collect on federal lands. Um, yeah, yeah, that looks like the, the BLM parking lot in Miles City. I've been there many times. For a year. And yeah, Mr. Dean, yeah, yeah, I think it is Miles City. Here. Yeah, Miles City is the... It's basically the only city or only like large town in the entire eastern half of Montana. Um, well, eastern third, we'll say. Haver is more, Haver's up on the high line. That's more like central Montana. And the whole eastern third of the, the state of Montana, there's only like one city with more than like a couple thousand people. Um, and that's Miles City. Here, let's look it up. Mile City, Montana. Yeah, wow. Bustling metropolis with over 8,000 people. Holy cow. Yeah, Mile City. Airport and Jordan. <laughs> Jordan, Montana is uh, where I've done a ton of work. And they have a population of like 200. That's the only town in the entire county. County practically the size of the state of Connecticut. Garfield County. Jordan's the only town there. So yeah, anyway. Um, the only city around big enough for a Walmart. Exactly, Steely Dan, yeah. yeah. Uh, most towns over there are what we call map dots. Yeah, there you go, Miss Crichton. Yeah. Uh, Miss Crichton is also from Montana, if anybody's wondering. Um, anyway, let's get back to this. And because the Dinosaur Discovery Museum is so focused on dinosaur evolution, you'll see those are the fossils we are after. I have learned a number of things from Dr. Carr on these digs. One. <laughs> uh, uh, Thomas Carr, oh boy, he's a character. You know, you could, you could just ask people to wake up but you can also bang a metal pot with a metal spoon. Is that we have to start our day early because it gets yeah. way too hot to work in the afternoon. Do you want coffee? Please. Black. And yeah, so shoot, they're they're probably waking up at like 5.30 in the morning here. Um, This is not how I do it when I'm in the field. We just deal with the heat, you know? It might be 110, 115 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what, like 41, 42, 43 degrees Celsius, something like that. Um, and yeah, that's just, you just get used to it after a while. You know, make sure you drink plenty of water. Uh, yeah, but it just comes with the territory. Waking up earlier like this might, I don't know. This hasn't worked on some of the crews that I've been on, but that's the way that, that Dr. Carr likes to run things. So, yeah. Um, 
MLS says, I definitely choose to get up before sunrise, and some people do that. Yeah. An 109 Fahrenheit is 43 Celsius? Shoot, I thought 43 Celsius was more. Okay, 45 degrees Celsius. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Horns fan wants to know why Montana is so sparsely populated. Um, it was one of the last of the U.S. states to be settled by settled by uh, like Anglo settlers, and there's just there's not a lot there really. Um, it's not the best state for agriculture. It's not really centrally located where like railroads are gonna go through it and lots of towns are gonna spring back spring up there naturally. Um, the terrain tends to be pretty harsh. Much of the eastern part of the state you might even be able to classify as desert, if not like dry prairie or Yeah, and also it gets dreadfully cold there during the winters. I lived in Bozeman, Montana in the southwestern part of the state for almost 10 years. Eight years, actually. Eight years I lived in Bozeman. Almost eight years, exactly. And, uh, yeah. I remember one time, I think it was in, like, February of 2014. It was negative 40 degrees for, like, two weeks straight. I noticed how I didn't say Celsius or Fahrenheit there because negative 40 is where those two scales intersect. Negative 40. Yeah. My record cold without wind chill was around negative 45. Yowza, Mr. Ictian. Yowza. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, Montana is, uh... Here. Um... Why some states are sparsely populated... There was an interesting video that I saw about this. Um, it might have been this one? Or maybe it was this one? Yeah. Here, let's the take a look. The United States is one of the largest countries in the world in terms of both size and population. But the link. United States population is not evenly distributed across the country. And while most people live on either the eastern half of the country or the west coast, yep. there's a really large belt of land in the middle of the country that is almost entirely empty. Yep. Here's why. This is not the same one that I that I saw, though. Um, maybe it was this. The United States is enormous. In fact, it's the third largest country by both area and population. And yet, despite being home to 334 million residents, nearly half of the country remains completely uninhabited. It wasn't this either. With more people living in New York City than the following nine states combined. Why do so few Americans live in these empty, isolated states, despite many offering stunning scenery? Find out in... And let's hit 5,000 likes for a video on the largest, emptiest regions of the world. Number mm. nine, Maine. Maine is... Yeah, well, here. Mm. The United States... Let's get to where he talks about Montana. It would be nice if... If YouTube would give us chapters here. But it... Number four, North Dakota. Number six, D Delaware is tiny. I don't even know why they include that. That's ridiculous. Um, that looks way too built up to be Montana. Let's see. Let's get to the Montana part. Um, that's Alaska right there, which is enormous. Um, Vermont. Is Wyoming going to be number one? I don't even know. Let's go back to this video. The U yeah. It's about 350,000 square miles. 
To put this number in perspective, if this area was its own state, it would be larger than any current existing state aside from Alaska, which is about 570,000 square miles. All told, it makes up approximately 12% of the contiguous United States. So that's but eastern Montana Alaska, right there, that's including Ekalaka, where the Thomas Carr is digging in this video. It's just 3.1 million people, uh, or less than 1% of the United States' total population. That's almost equal to the same size as the metropolitan area of Denver, Colorado, which we'll get to in a little bit. In every other region of the contiguous United States, multiple major population centers will break up the otherwise expanse of rural farms, mountains, or forests. And that's not to say there aren't any population centers, but they're still fairly small. The largest population... Yep. Um, anyway, where was this? Shoot. There was a really decent... Was it from real life lore? Hmm. Wyoming and Colorado. It wasn't this. Um, maybe it was from this channel, and it was about, uh, Canada. Let's You've see. probably seen a map of the world before. Yeah. Let's see. Why America's North is emptier than Canada's South. Here we go. This is the one, I think. When it comes to land, Montana is one of the biggest states in America. Yes, this is exactly the one that I was looking for. Ho, 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 ho. Yeah. Okay. He starts off with Montana. This is exactly what I was looking for here. Um, here's a link to this video right there before I forget and before I get distracted. Here we go. When it comes to land, Montana is one of the biggest states in America. It's the fourth largest state overall, and it sits only behind the well-known big three American states of Alaska, Texas, and California. Montana yeah. is even larger than Germany is in terms of area, but it's mm -hmm. vastly smaller when it comes to the size of population. Because for all its huge amounts of space, Montana is a pretty desolate place. As of yep. 2023, the entire statewide... I mean, Montana's a beautiful state, and they... Montana has some of the best dinosaur fossils in the entire United States. It's got a lot going for it. But large population is not one of those things. Population is only about 1,140,000 people. I mean, yeah, for those of you who are in the United States, it's funny, I was just talking with Snail Chaser on the phone about this before I started streaming today, Lenina. Montana has one telephone area code for the entire state. That's 406. 406 is the area code. One telephone area code for the entire state. So growing up, I had friends at school, like five different friends might have five different area codes um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. But an entire state has few enough people that you can have one area code for the entire state. So yeah. Yeah. And Ms. Drictian says, you see, for me, more than one area code seems nuts. I have neighbors with different area codes, Ms. Drictian. Yeah. Yeah. We're like one or two towns over, there's a different area code. Um, Just because there's, you know, 12 million people that live in the San Francisco Bay Area. 12 times the entire population of Montana just here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Oh yeah, yeah. When I moved to to Montana, it felt incredibly empty. It was crazy, you know. And sometimes I would like travel across the state, and then I'd like recognize people. Like, oh yeah, I've seen you in Bozeman. They happen to be in Haver for the day too. It's like, oh yeah, I've seen that guy. I've seen him on the bus. There's just not very many people in Montana, you know. Yeah. But yeah. And yay for chances. Nevada has two area codes. One for the Las Vegas area and one for the rest of the state. I'm surprised they only have one for the Las Vegas area. It's still just just one for Vegas? Yay for chance? Huh. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And what is the population of Montana again? It's roughly one million people. Tannerine. Yeah. And on the west side, in my home county of Flathead, yeah, Flathead County's beautiful, by, uh, like, Kalispell, uh, the number of people seems nuts, and it's even pales in comparison. Yeah, that's nothing, Mr. Ictium, that's nothing, you know? There are... There are high schools that have more students 
like within walking distance of me here in in the Bay Area, there are high schools that have more students in each grade than entire counties have people in Montana. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, let's start this over because we got a couple seconds into it. When it comes to land, Montana is one of the biggest states in America. It's the fourth largest state overall, and it sits only behind the well-known big three American states of Alaska, Texas, and California. In Montana terms of land is area. larger than Germany is yeah. in terms of area, but it's vastly smaller when it comes to the size of population. Because for all its huge it's amounts of space, Montana is a pretty desolate place. As of 2023, the entire statewide population is only about 1,140,000 people, compared with yeah. Germany's 84 and a half million people. To put in an even greater perspective how empty that makes most of Montana, there are fewer people who live here than in the state of New Hampshire, a state that is about 16 <laughs> times smaller than Montana is in terms of land. In yep. a state which is at a similar northern latitude at the top of the continental 48 U.S. states. Montana's average population density statewide is thus only about 2.9 people per square kilometer, which is the third yep. lowest density in America after only the notoriously empty states of Alaska and Wyoming. And that yep. makes Montana one of the most sparsely populated locations in the world. <laughs> if Montana were an independent country, it would be in the top four lowest densities in the world, right in the company of countries <laughs> like Namibia, Australia, and Mongolia. Consequently, there aren't really any big cities or even towns to speak of in Montana. Yep, yep, shoot, I, uh... I can tell you all of these. Population one right there, that's Billings, Montana, and 117,000. Back when I lived there, I felt like they just crested 100,000. Um, this one right here is going to be Livingston, I think, at 53,000. Uh, Bozeman, wait, no, that can't be right. Livingston has more people than Bozeman? Unless that's Bozeman, 53,000. Um, anyway, I think that's Missoula and Helena. No, this seems wrong. That's Fort Peck Lake right there. This is where I used to do field work right here in, uh, up here and up here too. Garfield County, Valley County. Number three is Great Falls. Great Falls has 60,000 people, Mastrictian. When I visited Great Falls, it seemed so much smaller than Bozeman. Yeah. Huh. Jaded Fairy says yes. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um. And do they have a CO2 emission per capita statistic too? I've seen stats on this. It's very high, Tannerim. It's very high. Um, Montanans do a lot of driving, uh, eat a lot of meat. The carbon, well, let's get into the idea of carbon footprints. Because that's a, like a made up industry thing to try and get people to think that carbon emissions are a personal responsibility that rather than something that corporations are responsible for. But, uh, but anyway, yeah. Of the top five largest settlements in the state today, only Billings has a population in excess of 100,000 people. And even yeah. then, it just barely does at 117,000 people as of 2023. And then going even further, all of the U.S. states around Montana are pretty much just as desolate and empty as well. To the east, it says desolate. This feels like he's throwing shade. Like, Montana's a wonderful place, and I feel like that's one of its strong suits, is that there are not very many people there. Um, That's one of the things that Montanans love most about Montana. There's North Dakota. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Which is about equivalent to Washington State in geographic size, but which only has about a tenth of Washington's population. Despite them yep. both being at about the same latitude at the this top of the This is a pretty problem. I know, right, Mr. Ignan? North Dakota yeah. is thus the fourth least densely populated American state yeah. right after Montana, with only about 4.4 .4 people. And Fluke says, I'm a truck driver. Once I was heading west at sunrise. Pull over to take a breather. Yeah, oh man, Montana at sunrise. Gorgeous. Gorgeous! Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. It was 1996 and I remember it clearly. Beautiful. It's um it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh driving through Montana is really something. As long as the, the ice the roads aren't completely iced over and as long as you don't have drunk drivers careen careening everywhere. Um because that is definitely a thing.
Um. Yeah. Uh. Um. Yeah, here we go. Take a look at this. Representative Hale. So this is in the the uh, the Montana House, uh, the Montana State House of Representatives, um, and here's a a state representative who's arguing for the abolition of drunk driving laws in Montana. Mr. Chairman, I have to rise in opposition to this, along with all of the other DUI laws. These DUI laws are not doing our small businesses in our state any good at all. They're destroying them. They're destroying a way of life that, that has been in Montana for years and years. These, the, these taverns and bars in these smaller communities connect people together. They're the center of the communities. And I'll, I'll guarantee you, there's only two ways to get there. Either you hitchhike or you drive. And I'll, I promise you that they're not going to hitchhike. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> uh. He was legitimately just arguing for drunk driving, Mariel. Probably not surprisingly, he's a he was a tavern owner or a bar owner. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, even in state, he was pretty soundly ridiculed. Good, Mr. Dictan, yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, Montana, kind of a wild place in, in some ways. But, man! Is it an excellent place to find fossils. So, let's get back to that. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah, and Montana is east of the Rocky Mountains, right? So the Rocky Mountains make up the... The Rocky Mountains run through western Montana. I'll show you again. Uh, let's have a... There we go. That'll do it. Yeah. Here's Montana right here. This is kind of... This is an interesting map projection because it kind of squashes it this way a little bit. But these are the Rocky Mountains throughout here. And the western border of Montana here is the Continental Divide. So the reason why this line looks like the eastern line for Idaho is because it is. Idaho is right here. Um, and the Continental Divide is... Well, maybe we'll watch a little video on that. About the Continental Divide. Because... I have had the privilege of, uh... Well, here, I'll show you. The Continental Divide crosses the United States from the northwest corner of Montana. Oh, and shoot! I was wrong about this! Oh, man, it runs through Montana. I thought it, it provided the boundary between Montana and Wyoming over here, but only toward the bottom, does it? So I've done field work right here near the town of Lima, Montana. It's spelled just like Lima, Peru, but it's pronounced Lima. So I've done field work here, um, digging up dinosaur footprints, collecting dinosaur footprints here with Giulio Panashi, um, who was looking at those for his thesis. But that's the Continental Divide right there. The Continental Divide crosses the United States from the northwest corner of Montana to the southwest corner of New Mexico. Yep. In Colorado, it follows a series of peaks through the Rockies. The tallest of these is also the tallest in the state. Mike's Mount Albert. Peak. No, Mount Albert, shoot. <laughs> this hiker, attempting the summit of Mount Albert's 14,433 foot peak, is walking the ridge that literally splits America in two. Yeah. Any rain or melting snow to his left flows west towards the Pacific. Yep supplying water to thirsty populations in the southwest. The water that falls to the right of this ridge flows east towards the Atlantic. <laughs> so there's there's kind of a tradition here since 
you know, any any water that falls on the Continental Divide, if it's to the west, it flows to the west into the Pacific. If it's to the east of this one line right here, it goes down to the Atlantic. And there's there's a tradition among Montanans that you go and you find the Continental Divide and then and then you try and find exactly where that is, and then you pee on it. <laughs> some of it goes to the Pacific, and some of it goes to the Atlantic. That's the idea. And I've done this, but this is uh, it's kind of a rite of passage um, in western Montana. But yeah, yeah. Uh, only in Montana. And it, it probably also exists in Colorado and New Mexico, etc. But, uh, yeah. And Lewis and Clark did travel through their high-tech low life. Yes, indeed. In western Montana, and I guess eastern Montana too, along the Missouri River, you can't swing a live cat without the cat landing on some sort of monument to Lewis and Clark. You know? Uh, yeah. And helps yeah. nourish communities and farms from Colorado's plains all the way to the Mississippi River. There you go, Ray Cadactylus. <laughs> A quarter of all water in the U.S. originates uh. here in the Rocky Mountains. Which is why protecting this watershed is so important. Yeah. So that's the a continental divide. But the mountains along the divide also hold some of the richest mineral deposits in America. The challenge is to get those minerals out without polluting the drinking water of millions. Or maybe don't get them out. Maybe you tell the shareholders to take a hike, you know? I think more shareholders should be told to take a hike. Sometimes into a live volcano, you know? north of Mount Albert, the Climax Mine straddles the Continental Divide. Oh boy, I don't want to see this. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, Montana, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, <laughs> the sellers is like, man, yeah. Uh <laughs> he does, yeah. 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 Leave them in the ground, they're comfy there. For minerals, yes, if it's just for profit. But if we're just digging at the surface for dinosaur fossils for the benefit of science, you know, let's do it carefully, but let's do it. Here. We also have to leave camp with everything we need. Yeah, so let's let's go back to the beginning of this. Finally, get onto the field. This do. is this is a very I like this little field, field documentary they put together here we from Carthage College. Do what we've been waiting to do for a year. Here's a link to this video. Yeah. And because the Dinosaur Discovery Museum is so focused on dinosaur evolution, you'll see those are the fossils we are after. I have learned a number of things from Dr. Carr on these digs. One is that we have to start our day early because it gets way too hot to work in the afternoon. Hmm. Do you want coffee? Please. Black? We also have to leave camp with everything we need, so there's a lot of prep work to be done. When we have all of our equipment, along with plenty of food and water, we are ready to head out for a busy and safe day. And it's time for me to do a paleo lord. Thank day. you. Poor the first is prospecting. Yeah. That. I've gotten these Look, untangled. Prospecting is looking around or carefully observing your area for bone-like objects. Walking around the hillside, we look for scatter or possibly just a single bone or fragment. This is what... So yeah, we were talking about prospecting and yesterday, what? and this is an illustration of how that works, you know? We don't just go and dig in a random spot or you'd be digging forever. You never find anything. We look for fossils that are already eroding out of the ground, and that's how we find them. We do is we follow it up. And there's more bone up there, so it, who knows? It may continue further up. If we find something of interest, we look at it more closely. We carefully dig around the object, exposing it without harming or disturbing it. That's rock. Yeah. Sand's done. That's a hateful way to wake up. I know, right, Damon? I might have found something yeah. else. I, I, it looks exactly the same. Usually, this growth won't be hanging on to a, a rock. It'll be hanging onto a bone. Sometimes, so, yeah. So I'm not sure. I think I should ask uh, Eric to come over. And... There is a thing where plants really like to to put their roots around fossil bones because there's more minerals there and it's more friable than just like a rock in the ground. Um, 
And sometimes you get really unlucky and a, a plant has just decided to sink its roots into a dinosaur bone and just kind of destroy it. It happens sometimes. Take a look at this. Yes? Maybe? Yeah, I think so. Looking like it. Oh, yeah. This is usually the indication to me. Is this growth on here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, that's a piece of bone. It's definitely a piece of bone. Once something is identified as a bone, mm -hmm. we start a process called quarrying. Quar oh, no. You find bone all over the place. You don't always start quarrying every time you find a bone. Or you'd be digging quarries everywhere. you got to determine that that bone is actually something important and that it's actually associated with more elements and that it's worth collecting. It's... Yeah. Quarrying yeah. is digging around the fossil to expose it and to see if there are other bones around. There are very important parts of this process, does, yeah. including <laughs> first marking the object's exact location. We do this using GPS. Yeah. This and Phoenix says, was he wielding a screwdriver there? I mean, yeah, sometimes we use screwdrivers in the field. It's not the most precise piece of equipment, but sometimes we'll hand screwdrivers to the volunteers. <laughs> um, because they don't really make specialty tools for paleontologists. Not, not really. There's a few, but like, it's not like in archaeology where you all have trowels. There's a, a specific kind of trowel, I forget what it's called, but it's like the gold standard in archaeology, right? We don't have that. Nobody makes specialist tools for, for paleontologists. Um, we'll use what we call scratch awls for digging. Um, like this. Yeah, a scratch awl, like that. Or, oyster knives are, uh, are really excellent. We use a lot of these in the field as well. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. All or nothing. Yeah, there you go, Andy. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Irrefutable says, that's it, I'm making the Dino Digger 3000, the first machine for dinosaur digging. It's funny that you say that, Dr. Irrefutable, because, well, A, we really don't need machines for digging in the field. We have the tools that we need for that. It's often like transporting those fossils that's really the, the difficult thing over rough terrain. Here, let me show you. See, where did that book go? Um, when I was in sixth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, seventh grade, I think, uh, there was a, a project that we had to do for science class. We had to come up with an invention. And I came up with an invention based on something that I saw in one of Jack Horner's books. Let me find that book for you and find the picture. And then I'll tell you my realization about the thing later on when I saw it in person. Let's see. It's in the book Dinosaur Lives. Here we go. Um, here's the... The paperback one right here. Dinosaur Lives by Jack Horner. And here's the hardcover. And let me find this for you. Oh, there it is. I saw it. Yeah. Oh, so here is a... Removing a clutch of eggs from Landslide Butte area. Ricky Reagan, whose land we were camped on, is on horseback. All right, so often getting really heavy fossils over rough terrain from an area back to the vehicles and back to the road where you can transport them, that's one of the biggest problems in field paleontology. Um, and so to help try and solve that, Jack Horner's friend Bob Makala invented something he called the dino wheel which can be used by two people to get heavy loads in and out of areas having no roads. And so, 
I saw this and I thought, this is so cool. He, he handmade this. He used a bunch of pipe and he welded it. That's a bicycle wheel right there, maybe a dirt bike wheel. Um, with like an off-road tire on it. And so my invention that I came up with in, uh, in seventh grade was a variation on this, but with two wheels. So it would be more stable. And you could, it had attachment points, you could link it up to a horse, or to a helicopter, or to an off-road vehicle, or whatever. Um, I thought this was so cool because, you know, here in this book, this is all I had to go on here. So in seventh grade, I thought this was the coolest thing ever, reading this book. But then, fast forward to when I was an undergraduate at Montana State University and working with Jack Horner I uh I think it was 2012 um we went up to to Shoto to Egg Mountain and we were picking up supplies for field work so we could go out to Jordan go out to Hell Creek um and drive all the way across the state again after picking up stuff near Shoto near Egg Mountain and, uh, and I saw it there. I'm like, holy cow! Denver and Liz, isn't this... The dino wheel? Isn't this Bob Mackle's dino wheel? And they both rolled their eyes and groaned and said, Yeah! Oh, that thing! That thing twisted so many people's ankles. Gave people so many... Strained backs and blisters and just... They're like, that thing is cursed. It doesn't work. <laughs> uh, never meet your heroes, you know? Yeah. So, uh, that's why it never caught on, I guess. It looked cool in the picture. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway. Who was it who said that they were going to make a... Dr. Irrefutable says, that's it, I'm making the Dino Digger 3000. First machine for dinosaur digging. We've got the digging part down. It's moving those heavy fossils. Big field jackets full of rock and, and fossil bone. Over rough terrain, that's a real problem to be solved. If you want to make a big difference for field paleontology, if you want to become a beloved figure among paleontologists the world over, invent something like that something that can help us transport those fossils more easily. And Kelmir says, the guy did try. Oh, he definitely did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's really cool. Like, this inspired me as a kid, seeing that in that book. But, uh... But, yeah. Yeah, it's still an unsolved problem. How about a powered wheelbarrow? Well, it has to be able to, to deal with really rough terrain. That's the problem. And a pickup, something that's that can deal with rougher terrain than a pickup truck, Tannerine. Yeah. You know, actually, when I first saw this, it was my very first thought. Um... Yeah... When I first saw... When I first saw this... <laughs> that was my first thought. Is, oh man. We need some of these for the field. <laughs> yeah. Ash River says called it, yeah. Let the, big dog the thing is, we lowly paleontologists would be the last to get anything like this, you know? It would be really cool, you know?
Yeah. An oxen cart would be cheaper. It's hard to find an oxen cart. You know? You gotta feed them. You gotta transport them to, uh, to where you're going. Yeah. I mean, just imagine you've managed to load a bunch of big fossil jackets onto uh, onto this, and then you can just sit back with a bottle of water and just watch that thing carry the jackets back to camp. Uh, maybe even walk up a ramp into the back of a truck or something like that. Man, that would be cool. But, uh, yeah, anyway. We don't have that kind of thing. Hugin! Thank you for the raid. Oh yeah, new sound? What's this? Good stuff, Hugin. Yeah. Good stuff. has a new sound for their three listeners. Welcome, welcome, Hugin. How did your stream go? Doing some Path of Titans. I hope they stayed on the path. Straight too far from it. It's good to have you here, Hugin. Yeah. They added a kilobator to Path of Titan, so I had to try it. Oh, is it any good? Yeah, let's look that up. Here. Um. You know, that's not the worst, if this is what it looks like. I don't know what's going on with that skeleton there, though. That looks awful. But the Astromia sword doesn't look too bad. It looks a lot like, uh... Huh. That's not too shabby. In fact, that's actually pretty good. I like this. I do like this. Oh, man. And this is going to introduce this dinosaur to more people. This is a net positive. I'm all for it. Yeah. Beautiful. Kelmir says, accurate dinosaur game? Uh, yeah, this isn't bad. This part, at least. So this is a big dromaeosaur from Mongolia. Um, if you want a, a really decent dinosaur game, that's really, really accurate. Yeah, see, this dinosaur did not live at the same time or the same place as Triceratops. That much is definitely wrong. Is this supposed to be a different Dromaeosaur here? Yeah. The feathers look good, though. I like this. Anyway, cool. Cool. Anyway, I would recommend Saurian if anybody's looking for a scrupulously accurate, authentic dinosaur game. Yeah, I really, I really like Saurian. I'm a Saurian guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. And, oh, and Cast the Dreamer, I think I remember that game that you're talking about. Was that, uh... Is that this right here? I had this when I was a kid and it was so cool. What you do is you just walk around and look at different, you know, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, plesiosaurs in their environment. You can't interact with them. You're like the ghost of Christmas past. You just walk around and, uh, or you kind of float around and just observe everything. It was so cool. I loved this when I was a kid. This was the peak of dinosaur video games. As an aspiring paleontologist. Yeah. 
Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, excellent. Anyway, it's good to have you here, Hugo. Let's get back into this video. Shoot, we, uh... It's taking us forever to get through this. Let's get through this, and then we'll do Metazua. Definitely a piece of bone. Once something is identified as a bone, mm -hmm. we start a process called quarrying. Quarrying is digging around the fossil to expose it and to see if there are other bones around. There are very important parts of this process, including first marking the object's exact location. We do this using GPS. This mm. ensures that we always know precisely where the bone was found. Yep. Really yeah. important stuff. As much dirt as possible needs to be removed without disturbing the bone. This is what we call overburden, removing the dirt on top. You get down to the bone layer. In we the then rock. apply coats of a liquid plastic called Vinac to stabilize the fossil. The site is also mapped before removing any bones, which helps pinpoint their relationship to one another. And this brings up a good point. During a dig, we log or take notes on everything. It is important to have documentation on all aspects of fossil digs. I'm just kind of taking some notes on what we did yesterday. After the fossils are stabilized, GPS and mapped, they are wrapped in a messy but sort of fun process called jacketing. Yep, jacketing plaster jacket. ensures that each specimen is protected as much as possible. <laughs> there you go, Plockman's yeah. In case the bone inside a plaster jacket, when the top half is dry, uh. the fossils rolled over and the jacket is completed. The jacketed fossil bakes for about a day in the sun and is then ready for transport. Some jackets get very heavy. We yeah, have... this is what I was talking about. This is one of the most difficult parts of dinosaur paleontology in the field is moving those jackets. Holy cow. Did they take a lot of effort? You know, this one looks fairly easy. They could just put it into like a makeshift stretcher like that. But some of these get so large that you actually need a helicopter in order to move them. I'll show you pictures from when we had a helicopter in 2011 at the Yoshi's Trike site. Um, here we go. Fieldwork photos, summer 2011. Yeah. Uh, here is one of the jackets. This is a small one that we could carry by hand. And I did some doodles on it with a Sharpie. Um, we want to show, like, where you're supposed to cut into it in the lab. Along the lip right there. Uh, and then we label the site. Hell Creek 2011. Um, yeah, yeah. But do I have a picture of the T-bomb? I better. If I don't, I'll be disappointed in myself. I don't see it. Dude. We had this huge jacket that was like the size of a car. In fact, this might be... There we go. Yeah, that's us working on the underside of it. Um, there's Alessandro Chiarenza, who published that paper on the... Uh, asteroid impact, not volcanism, caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. That's Alessandro Chiarenza right there. There's Denver Fowler, and I forget this guy's name. He was only with us for a few weeks. Jason, I think, from the UK. Um, but yeah, so we're like carving down after flipping the T-bomb, this huge jacket with the Triceratops sacrum in it. The sacrum, the sacrum and the hips, too. The ilia were in that. So, um, yeah, the, the back of the hips and then the vertebrae that are in the hips. It was, uh... Yeah, oh boy, that was something. Anyway, uh, yeah, this was so heavy that we had to hire a helicopter. And Jack Horner luckily had, uh, had the funds for this at the time. He probably just called up one of his friends. Maybe he called up George Lucas or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, had this little helicopter. This was, uh, what is this? HD 500 or something? In, uh... The military version of this is called the Cayuse. I forget what the civilian model is called. But, uh... Yeah. This came to help us. 
There it is right there from Panhandle Helicopter. It flew in all the way from Idaho. And, uh... Yeah, it's, uh, transported some of our jackets like this. Um, from down in the canyon, up to the top where there was a flatbed trailer. So that we could haul the fossils back to the museum. There we go. Yeah. Um, but this little helicopter was too small and couldn't get the T-bomb, that huge, the biggest jacket. It couldn't get it. So we had to leave it there for like a month. And then Jack eventually had a Huey helicopter. Like a Bell UH-1 Iroquois, I think? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, good to have helicopter owning friends. No, these helicopters were not owned by a friend. These were, you know, this is from a private company, Panhandle Helicopter. Jack Horner had to like call up a, a friend with a bunch of money to ask for funds to be able to pay for this. That's how it happened. How much does that weigh? That the big, big, big jacket was probably a three or four thousand pounds, I would guess. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and Camellia says, a question for my kiddo. Are fossils heavier or lighter than bones? Excellent question. Fossils are almost always heavier than fresh bones. Because a fossil, in order to become a fossil, you've got to have minerals that seep into the bone itself and partly turn it to stone. And so they can be as heavy as rocks sometimes. Bones by themselves, especially when they're dried out, they tend to be very lightweight. Fossils tend to be much heavier. So, call back here. Here's a step-by-step -step guide to becoming a fossil. Has anybody here ever wanted to become a fossil before? Because this guide will show you how to do that. You might not like step one, though. Here, take a look. Step one, die. Once you are dead, your remains may be scavenged by other organisms. Step two, get buried fast. If you are buried rapidly, your remains won't completely decay or be carried away by scavengers. Me too, Sparky Pugwash. Your best bet for yeah. rapid burial is to die near or in a river. <laughs> Welcome, Sandra Jiggles. Good to have you here. Where water can deposit sediment over you. Step three, six, soak in oh, okay. groundwater for nice. a long, long nice. time. Groundwater contains minerals. Here we go. Yeah. Over time, dissolved minerals can harden after filling in cavities in your skeleton. Or the water can dissolve your skeleton, leaving only minerals in its place. Either way, your skeleton will turn to stone and you'll be a fossil. There you go. So fossils tend to be heavier than uh, than the original organic material that they're formed from. Does that make sense? Yeah. Step four, wait to be exposed. As the years go by, if you're lucky, sea levels can fall or rock can erode and expose you. Then if your luck holds out, you might get spotted by a fossil hunter and wind up in a museum collection where scientists can study you to learn about evolution. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff. So great question there, uh, Camellia and Kiddo. Thank you for asking that question. I appreciate it. And I hope that answer makes sense to you. And Horns fan, I agree. That belongs in a museum. Yes. Um... Anyway, we'll get back to this video when we, uh, after we jacket a fossil, well, the whole point of jacketing it, putting it in this protective cocoon of burlap and plaster of Paris, that whole idea is to be able to, to bring it back to the laboratory safe and sound so it can go into the museum. For about a day in the sun and is then ready for transport. Some yeah. jackets get very heavy. We had to carry this one back in the evening to avoid the heat of the day. 
this step-by-step -step procedure of a typical find, prospecting, quarrying, vinacking, mapping, jacketing, and finally extraction, aids in not only preserving the bones, but preserving and understanding what the bones and their location can mean. So I'm yep. definitely ending on a good note. It's pretty exciting. I mean, anytime you find any little thing, it's exciting. But being in the same grid with the um, with the portion of the femur we found last year, that's pretty exciting. Pretty exciting. After yeah, long hours tough. of digging, it's time to call it a day. We make sure our fossils are covered to protect them from the weather so we can pick up where we left off. We grab our personal items and head back to camp. Like any important undertaking, patience is key. And experiencing paleontology for a day hopefully demonstrates that patience has its own rewards. Great first day. And when a discovery is made, if the work is <laughs> done... video is very like Thomas Carr. It, like, it comports so well this personality that uh, hey, it makes me smile. Science is not boring. Check it out. Yeah. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Yeah, here, I'll give you a link to this video as well. There you go. Yeah. And, uh, plastered in Paris. That sounds like <laughs> how you would, how do you would sign a letter to, uh, to an advice columnist? Signed, plastered in Paris. And it did, yeah. Um, and thank you, Dr. Irrefutable, for that question. Thank you, Claire Burr, for reposting it. Is Yoshi's trike the biggest dinosaur you've dug up? Um,. I'm going to say no. Yoshi's trike was pretty big. Uh, or the triceratops from the Yoshi's trike site. I'm trying to be precise, but yeah. Um, and, you know, it's a big critter. There's the skull right there from Yoshi's trike. Although I did not dig up the skull. I was digging up the post crania. Um, yeah, so everything behind the skull. The rest of the skeleton. It's a big animal, you know? It's roughly elephant-sized. Is it the biggest dinosaur I've ever dug up? Um, no. I've worked on... I've dug up a few sauropod bones before that were bigger than this. Um, probably from, like, a Hepatosaurus or maybe Diplodocus or maybe Barasaurus. We're not actually sure how big that was, but I've dug up a few bones from a, a dinosaur larger than Yoshi's trike. Oh, there's a beautiful Apatosaurus. Oh, man, I love that. Um, so yeah, a dinosaur like this, which would have been roughly, I don't know, 70, 80 feet long, something like that. Full grown. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Swordplay and Sorcery, welcome back. How are you doing? They want to know, how often does a profession like archaeology cross over with paleontology? Uh... Almost never. <laughs> um, yeah, so archaeology is the study of human artifacts. Archaeologists mostly work in dirt, you know, in like soil, basically, in what we would call overburden. Paleontologists, we look for fossils in rock. There's an old saying that, uh, oh, paleontologists, we dig deeper. It's not necessarily literally true, but the, you know, it's in bedrock rather than in, in soil or, you know, dirt at the top. Um, and Rousey, here, I have a command for that. Let's see. Prospecting? G GPR, maybe? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So yeah, yeah, uh, we actually had an archaeologist on our crew. We had an archaeologist who came to join us in Wyoming last summer. And let me see if I can possibly find one of the videos, one of the VODs that she was in. This would have been toward the end here.
Let's see here. Um, but she kept remarking how it was completely different from anything that she's ever done. So paleontology and archaeology work very, very, very differently. Oh, and we got a big old cricket here. Hey, cricket, right? Where is, uh, where is Elena? Might be toward the beginning of the video, actually. But this is toward the end of the field season. Or the end of, uh, of our work in Wyoming, at least. Yeah. And John Pabonis never found any... Well, I found little bits of amber before, but they're not, like, jewelry-quality amber. We still collected them because there's a Pretty chance right they could have especially for important data day. inside them. But we did have little bits of... Occasionally, you find little bits of amber. Amber is just fossilized tree resin. Fossilized tree sap, basically. Yeah. yeah. How are things going over here? Nice. Just... Away. Yeah, there's Elena right there, our archaeologist. Um, where she had met Ethan a few years before, and... I guess she reached out to him and, and had been like, hey, do you need any other volunteers? And he's like, yeah, come join us. So I check in again. Let me know. She wanted to know what it was like to dig up dinosaurs. I can put this down, but yeah, it's like we're pretty well covered. Endure. <laughs> Everybody come say on. hi to Quinn. Hi, Quinn. <laughs> what's your music recommendation for today? Oh. <laughs> Just so I can put you on the spot. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> if you've never listened to The Dark Side of the Moon fully through... Oh, nice. Ah, oh, Pink Floyd. While you're watching uh, Wizard of Oz? Yes. While you're... <laughs> it doesn't really line up. <laughs> That's what I've heard. It, it does yeah. line up. It does. Don't you have to like wait like 20 seconds or something? You agree with him, Jaded Fairy? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, man. <laughs> but let's pretend it does. Yeah. yeah. There's um. some parts where you're like, whoa. <laughs> and Kelmir says, I mean, getting someone to help uh, who at least knows how to move dirt better than others is more than a rando helping. It depends. Like, we had a lot of randos helping us this summer, and some of them were really, really helpful. The thing is, you don't have to be trained as a paleontologist to be of tremendous help on a paleontological dig. The main qualities for joining a crew of, of paleontologists and helping dig up a dinosaur, the main qualities are, are you available? Can you be there for, like, a week or something? Are you okay spending a lot of time in the outdoors, under a beating sun, maybe harsh weather conditions, you know, getting bitten by bugs, all kinds of stuff like that? Are you okay with roughing it, as Mark Twain would say? Can you sleep in a tent for two weeks straight without it really getting to you? Um, are you okay with primitive conditions? You know, are you okay with pooping in a bucket, or maybe in a hole in the ground that you that you dig. Um, yeah. And do you get along well with other people? Can you be cheerful even when things don't go well? Can you be enthusiastic about working together as a group? And working toward a common goal, even if it's uncomfortable? You know? We're really... You know, conditions can be rough in a place like this. This is what we called Skull Ridge this summer, and this was usually a miserable miserable place to work because it's at the top of this ridge, and the wind here was really strong, so you're just getting whipped in the face by wind all day long. That fierce Wyoming wind. And after a while, it just tires you out. Like, this was my least favorite place that I worked in Wyoming this past summer, at the top of Skull Ridge. Because even though we've got the skull of a duckbill dinosaur up here, it was just... Ugh. There's zero protection from the wind up here. And it was relentless. To the point where a lot of us ended up wearing scarves over our faces and, like, ski goggles the whole time. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and John Pabona says, as Winston said in Ghostbusters, if there's a steady paycheck... <laughs> oh, there's not. Nobody here is getting paid. Uh-uh. This is volunteer work. That's another big thing, is you've got to be okay with volunteering. Because we did not have the budget to be able to, uh, to pay anybody for this. So, yeah, you're outlaw. I mean, fair enough, John. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, actually, strictly speaking, let's be honest here. I was the only one who was getting paid because I was able to stream during this. <laughs> so I was able to get paid well, through Twitch. To discover that and uh... probably their greatest legacy. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, it probably is. Yeah. Well, cool. I got some more questions in chat, so let me answer those. Um, Cephalomov says, did your experience teaching help the transition to science outreach? It certainly did, yeah. Actually, that's what kind of prompted it. Because um, I was teaching full-time, and then COVID hit in March of 2020. And the school that I was teaching at closed its doors, and we switched to, you know, like online, teaching over Zoom, basically. And uh, so I had to get a webcam and figure all that stuff out. And then that's the same... Oop. There's a lizard over there. Hang on. <gasps> you doing some push-ups at me, lizard? Is that a threat display? Oh. Is that so him right scary. here? Look at you. No. Right here? Where? Look at you. Yeah. Oh, right here? Where? What are you doing? Some kind of spiny lizard. Uh, that's the name of the whole group, I think, is the spiny lizards. I didn't realize. So I don't have a viewfinder on this, and I can't. I can't tell what people can see and what they can't on the camera. So apologies for. Yeah, yeah. Tail going under. Hey, lizard friend. How you doing? Yeah. Well, somewhere in go. here. Anyway, yeah. Uh. It was right when COVID hit that I also met uh, Ios and Lordy, and Ios introduced me to Twitch. And uh, I was already teaching online at the time via Zoom. And I said, well, shoot, why don't I try to do something similar on Twitch? And Is snakes a problem? Asked Tannerim. No. Snakes are never a problem, Tannerim. Snakes are a solution. Uh, we do get snakes. You know, there's snakes that live in Wyoming. Rattlesnakes. Bull snakes, garter snakes, um, but yeah, yeah, I've never had a problem with snakes in the field. Um, although this past summer, we got a bunch of rattlesnakes in camp in Utah right before I left. Let me show you a photo of one. Let's see, let's go back to August of 2023. Oh yeah, and shoot, check out this beautiful collared lizard that I photographed. Like, the reptiles really came out in force at the end of, uh... at the end of our field season. Look at all the jackets we got, too. Um, out of that site in, uh, in Utah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but there were a bunch of rattlesnakes. I'm really, really glad that I brought my snake stick with me into the field. Because I was able to relocate two or three rattlesnakes that wandered into camp. Uh, including this beautiful one right here, which is a prairie pygmy rattler, I think. Yeah. Lovely. Um, so yeah, I got pretty comfortable with picking up snakes with that stick and relocating them uh, to elsewhere, further away from camp, where we won't bother them and they won't bother us. You know? So yeah. Yeah. Um, Mommy does says, Little is trying to get out of bedtime by saying he used to watch Dr. Antusa instead. <laughs> oh, well, Mommy does, you could, uh, you could let him know that he can watch this later on YouTube if he would like to. Because there is a YouTube channel right here. And, uh, that video should pop up right here. Or if you go to videos, it should be the latest one. Here's yesterday's, for instance. When we were talking about our new dinosaur species, and doing Metazoa, and all that good stuff. So, you can always watch later, too, if it is time for bed. Uh, sleep is important, you know? Shoot, sleep helps our brains grow and develop. It helps flush out all of the junk that accumulates during the day. So you get a fresh, clean brain for the morning. So, uh, if any of you have to go to bed right now, like you, Tannerim, 
Good night to you, too. You sleep well, huh? See it tomorrow, I hope. Sleep helps you learn, too? It's true, Sparky Pugwash, yeah. To get to have dreams, sometimes you might even have a dream about dinosaurs. Which is pretty cool. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. But, yeah. Yeah. Anywho. So, yeah. Good stuff. Um. Oh, you know what? It's time for Metazoa. Let's do our, our day's Metazoa, shall we? Yeah. Uh, this is a daily online game that we play here on Paleontologizing. There's a mystery animal of the day, and we have to try and guess what it might be using phylogeny, using the evolutionary tree of life like this. So without further ado, let's, uh... Hold on to your butts. Let's get into it. Uh, and, uh... I like to start off by guessing a placental mammal. I'll show you how this works. Oh, Mayor Space has guessed porcupine. Before I could even ask for a placental mammal. Porcupine. Let's do that, Mayor Space. And very nice. So the way that this works is, you guess an animal here in the box, and then your guest shows up here, and then the mystery animal is here. This shows you the most exclusive evolutionary group that includes your guess and the mystery animal. So for porcupine, we have Borotheria. So our mystery animal is not a porcupine, but it is a Borotherian mammal. That's the closest it can give us. We all know the shtick, lol, says Cast a Dreamer. Some people are new here. Some people are new. Um, so yeah, let's... Let me show you what that means, Borotheria. So here is all life on Earth. We can zoom down to animals. Right here. We can zoom in further from animals to mammals. Down here. And then from mammals to Boro Eutheria. Boro. How did I do this wrong? Um. Bore o eutheria. There we go. There's an E before that. Bore eutheria. So this is a group of placental mammals that includes two major groups. We've got over here carnivorans, bats, hedgehogs, and more. It also includes the uh, the uh, excuse me ungulates, hoofed mammals over here. And then up here we've got. The rodents and primates, and also critters like rabbits. So rodents and relatives, and primates and relatives. So we guessed porcupine, porcupine, uh, porcupine. And we get Boreutheria. So we can already tell right here. We can cross this whole branch off. We know it's not going to be a Uarcantoglyer, so that's... 2,500 species we can cross off right here. We know it's not going to be a rodent or a rodent relative or a primate or a primate relative. Or else it'll sh it would have shown us this group. You are Contoglyra. But it doesn't. It shows us Borotheria, which tells us that our critter is over here. So let's look for some major splits within Theria, and let's continue our are uh, are narrowing it down. We could see if it's a bat, but I don't think it's going to be a bat. The likelihood it's a bat is pretty limb, slim. Let's see if it's an ungulate, if it's a hoofed mammal, or if it's one of these critters. Um, let's see if it's a carnivorin, actually. There's a lot of carnivorins in this game. So, chat, give me the name of a carnivorin. Mongoose, mommy does. Let's do a mongoose. 
quick on the draw there. Mongoose is a... It's not a... I don't think it's quite a, um... Mustelid, but it's related to Mustelids. And, okay, it is a Larasia Thier, but it's not a Mongoose. But since it didn't say Carnivora here, see how it doesn't say Carnivora? It says Larasia Theria. That means we're barking up the wrong tree here. It's not a Carnivoran. It's some other kind of Larasia Thier. Larasia Thier. Is it a hoofed mammal? Like a goat or a rhino? Give me the name of a hoofed mammal chat, and let's see if it's some kind of ungulate. Moose, says Ye for Shan. Let's try moose. And, oh, it's not a hoofed mammal either. So it's not going to be a cloven hoofed ungulate. It could be some kind of insectivore, but I think these guys are not very well known. It's probably not going to be one of them. It's not a carnivorant. It's not an even toed ungulate, an artiodactyl, like a moose. It could still be a bat. Hmm. Or it could be an odd toed ungulate. Give me the name of an odd toed ungulate, chat. A tapir, or a rhino, or a horse, or one of their relatives. Tapir, says Basil. Let's do tapir. Oh, they don't have tapir. Sorry to mislead you. Let's try zebra. Zebras are perissodactyl. And nope. It's not a perissodactyl either. Ah, bad luck. Bad luck. Let's try a bat. Like a vampire bat. And that's it. Well, well, well. You know, that's not the worst. That's not the worst. We got it in five guesses. Could be a lot worse than that. Yeah, we really got stuck here within Larasia Theria. But it's nice we were able to just get Bat on the first guess because here's the thing with bats. Um. There's a thousand species of bats, at least. So we're really lucky that the first bat that we guessed, it was that kind of bat, you know? So yeah. Yeah, anyway. And Makeaway says, I guess drinking blood isn't carnivorous? I mean, it is. But only one Batman? I don't know, I've seen a lot of Batman in my day, John Pavonis. Adam West, uh, Michael Keaton, Val Kilmer. So three, yeah. There have only ever been three Batman. <laughs> um, Clooney. Okay, Ungoy, four. There have been four Batman. Four. Patton's son? No, General George S. Patton was a, a U.S. Army general in the Second World War, say Taoshi. Ben Affleck? Kevin Conroy? Who are these people? Yeah. Um. <laughs> anyway, all of these Batman. Oh. <laughs> uh, we used to have a bat house for them to live in. Really? All those celebrities? That's pretty cool, Rusty Guy. That's pretty cool. Danny's lack of Batman knowledge exposed. You know what? I think Batman probably knows even less about me, so I think I have the upper hand there, Dr. Irrefutable. Yeah. Does Bat Boy count? Surely he grew up eventually. Does a bat, boy, a bat boy ever become a Batman? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe, uh... Hmm. 
Maybe a bird picked him off. Like a bat hawk. Maybe a bat hawk ate bat boy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do they do? Let's take a look at them. I know it's not Thursday Bird's Day, but still. Um. Yeah. Here, let's take a look at this. This is an old video. 15 years ago this was posted. Uh-oh. Watch out, Bat Boy. Hey, Hannies. Flying mammals today? No, not really. We just, we just, our, our, we just did Metazoa. <gasps> uh oh. There's a bat hawk. Uh oh. Watch out, bat boy. So this is why Birdman could defeat Batman, right? <laughs> the Greyhounds of the Bat World. <laughs> they're inexpensive, but they're not very comfortable. <laughs> uh, you might have to sit next to somebody who's going to try and sell you drugs on your way to Billings, Montana. Uh Suicide? Really? I just think it would be uncomfortable. Whatever. And simple Garrick. Bird bats are, are cute and cuddly. Birds are vicious creatures that eat bats. Look, watch. Yeah, watch this. Yoink. He says, all of a bit of that. Eating it in midair. Yeah. Oof. Yeah, it was a snatch. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why bats mostly come out at night in most parts of the world. I wonder how often the Hoot House livestream owls catch bats. Because owls are known to also catch and eat bats. At night. Yeah. Well, I mean, they don't really have a choice there. That's just kind of how it works. But yeah, yeah. They mostly come at night. Mostly. <laughs> I got that reference for once. From the film Aliens. Yeah. 
Babzilla says, I got to see hawks hunt bats last summer. One of the coolest and most gruesome things I've ever gotten to witness since I started actively birdwatching. That is actually very, very cool, Babzilla. I personally have never seen that, but that sounds like it'd be really, really neat. Yeah. <laughs> um. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Um. Anyway, cool things, cool things. Uh, so we did Metazoo. Excellent. And we are now, shoot, what are we at? Our streak is, uh, where is our streak at now? Oh, average guess is down to 5.5. Not too bad. Not too bad. We're improving. Uh, 11. An 11 streak right there. Not too shabby. I'm not gonna post this. Let's get it... Let, let's get it higher before I post it, but yeah. Anyway, Wheel 6-2, good to have you here. Welcome, welcome. Uh, and Smorphosaurus, you're back. It's good to see you. Uh, anywho, um... What were we talking about earlier? We were talking about... Oh, you know what? I wanted to share a piece of news with you. So earlier today, I was talking with Ethan Cowgill. Those of you who are watching our summer live streams from the field, you're, you're already familiar with Ethan. But Ethan was telling me that we are going to have some other paleontologists joining us this summer in the field, including... Someone who showed up before in these videos. Yeah. Check this out. A very dramatic quote there. One hundred million years before the birth of the first pharaoh. All right, all right, all right. The deserts of Egypt were verdant Edens, teeming with life. At the top of this food chain, dinosaurs ruled. Yep. Nearly one hundred years ago. And if you guessed Matthew McConaughey is going to be joining us this summer in the field, then... Sorry, that's not correct. No. A German aristocrat named Ernst Stromer ventured deep into this waste. He's kind of not going to join us either. He died to its prehistoric past. But... Hey, a salute to Ernst Stromer. The strange monsters he discovered would astonish the scientific community only to be blasted into dust by man-made fire from the skies. Yeah. For the next half a century, a hidden world lay buried under these shifting sands. Until a team of young scientists set out to resume Stromer's quest. Their mission? To unearth the remains of... And... There he is right there. Matt Lamana. Matt Lamana, sorry, is going to be joining us this summer in the field, rumor has it. No promises, but exciting stuff. Yeah. The remains of the lost dinosaurs of Egypt. Their discovery? Something so unexpected. It would supply one vital missing piece to the puzzle of a forgotten world. Yeah, in Wyoming, the Sierra Lenina. Good stuff. So this is from the Lost Dinosaurs of Egypt. And, uh... You can actually watch the whole thing here on... the old YouTube here. Um... There we go. We sort of had a different idea as to how... There he is talking there. The dig. 
Matt convinces Josh to complete their work at the site where they found a theropod ilium. I want whoever found this bone killed immediately. <laughs> um, it might not surprise you to find out that this guy here is not really working in paleontology anymore. Um, he's been kind of like drummed out of the field for like harassing people and just yeah. Anyway, uh, I think that's Josh B. Smith right there. But Matt Lamotta right here. Uh, here, I'll give you a link to this video. This is part two of The Lost Dinosaurs of Egypt, which I watched this as a kid, and it was the pinnacle of dinosaur media for me as an aspiring paleontologist. This was... I'd never seen a... like a televised dinosaur dig before. Of course, this is all footage that was recorded and then edited and put into a documentary, but it, at least to me, as like a 10-year-old child, it really made me feel like I was there. Very meaningful to me at the time, you know? And, uh... Yeah. Yeah. Anywho. Um, here, check this out. Here's Matt Lamana talking about the holotype Tyrannosaurus fossil, which somehow ended up in Pennsylvania after it was originally dug up in Montana. But here... Take a look. During We've watched this before. During summer 1902, prolific fossil hunter Barnum Brown discovered the first bones of... And you know what? Actually, let's... We've seen this video before. Let's take a look at... Try to find a shorter video with Matt Lamont. And let's try this one. One of the largest dinosaurs that ever lived was discovered in Argentina. A specialist from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History recently visited that country to examine the bones, and Dave Crawley has the story. Yeah. This dinosaur here is a Patasaurus. For a long time, this so it's Matt was thought there in, to be the, on the largest left. Uh, dinosaur, and actually the largest land animal that ever lived. Paleontologist Matt... And yeah, Argentina is one of the world's greatest countries for, for dinosaur fossils, P. Detritus. Viva Argentina. Claro que sí, P. Detritus. Yes, Argentina. Few countries have more or better dinosaur fossils than Argentina. Argentina. Incredible for dinosaur fossils. Matthew Lamana says yeah. brachiosaurs were discovered to be even larger, but that's before the titanosaur. Our new titanosaur, Noto Colossus, we estimate at between 82 and 92 feet long and between 44 and 66 tons in live mass. So, Matt Lamana looks like he might be joining us in the field this summer in Wyoming, which would be super, super cool. And it's neat because he's a big shot in, in dinosaur paleontology. I think he's curator of dinosaur paleontology at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Uh, which means, uh, well, that means there's some books that I've got to read before I meet him and have stuff to talk about, but this is going to be really cool. Last summer, Nick Longrich was, uh, was joining us, but Matt Lamana, it looks like might be joining us this summer in Wyoming. So you might be seeing a lot of him on our live stream broadcasts from Wyoming this summer. And that's actually pretty awesome when you think about it. When the bones were discovered by Bernardo Gonzalez Riga in his native Argentina, he invited his colleague from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History to join him. My role was to help describe the anatomy of this animal, figure out its evolutionary relationships, and try to, try to understand how big it was and how it might have lived. Titanosaurs were the largest land animals that ever existed. The humerus of Notocolossus Sauropods is even were. bigger than this one. It'd There's be a, a chance. inches longer and quite a lot wider. And There's a chance that some diplodocoid dinosaurs may have gotten larger than titanosaurs. We're really not entirely sure. 
But yeah, Another yeah. titanosaur has been assembled in a museum in New York City. His 39-foot neck is so long that it poked through the door of the exhibit hall. It's a similar species to the find in Argentina. Though these giants were vegetarians, the Nota Colossus was in no danger from Tyrannosaurus rex. They lived on two different continents, 20 million years apart, yeah. and the Titanosaur was six times as heavy as the T-Rex. That's no easy lunch. The new discovery will be assembled in Argentina, its natural habitat. Dave Crawley, KDKA TV News. One anyway, of the largest um, pretty cool stuff. So yeah, Matt LaMotta looks like he's going to be joining us. Um, and, oh, shoot. Well, this gets into what we were talking about yesterday. We were talking about that new Overaptorosaur. Here's Anzu here. Here in Dinosaurs in Their Time stands a nearly 10 foot tall fossil skeleton that begs the question, is that a bird? Raises is the that question. A dinosaur? Not... How do we... Oh boy, that's a pet peeve of mine. It's a brief aside. Begs the question is, that's a very, very specific thing wherein it's a logical fallacy wherein you like assume the uh, a certain premise without actually establishing it. Chat, don't don't use the phrase that begs the question because that's not what that that's not what that means. Oh boy, it raises the question. Say raises the question. You know, Rachodactylus says pet peeve of mine too. See, there's a reason you got that VIP badge there, Rachodactylus. Uh, it means assumes the consequent is true. Yes, yeah. Anyway, uh, is that a bird? Is that a dinosaur? Por qué no los dos? Yeah, that's the thing, Reanimated, but we're not totally sure that Manoraptor and dinosaurs are not birds. They might they might be true birds. We're not sure. Um, yeah, and well, hello, Sweetie Pie. Hey. S -s -s -s. Sweetie Pie, how are you doing? You want to come over here? Come here. Come over here. No? Well. Come here, sweetie pie. You gotta come up here. How oh, this works. you up onto the desk yeah oh would you like a treat you know that's good stuff oh you know that's good stuff come on up here why is she so hesitant right now come on up here sweetie pie Well, she's, uh... Sweetie. Come on over. Do you want to say hello to all the chatters? Yeah, here we go. Come on up here. Oh, that smell good? <laughs> Don't bite my fingers. You know, you gotta come up here if you wanna eat that. Well. We'll see if she, uh, if she decides to appear. Yeah. That begs the question. Is that a bird? Raises the question. Is that a dinosaur? How do we know? You're looking at Anzu Wileyi, a fossil from the age of dinosaurs. And yes, despite some very bird-like features, Anzu is a dinosaur. To know the difference, we... And look, 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 it's Sweetie Pie. Hi, Sweetie Pie. 
Oh, good stuff. How is that? Pretty good? What do you think, sweetie? Yeah. <laughs> she decided to make her entrance on her terms. Exactly. Typical feline, huh? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh, it's a weenie pie. Yeah. I had to make some emotes of of you, huh? Yeah. What do you think? Is that a good idea? Oh, want another one? That's good stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Good girl, sweetie pie. <laughs> go, sweetie. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are you looking at up there? Oh, are you pushing around the camera arm? Yeah. How about we get some brushing going? Oh, that's the stuff. Yeah, look at that. Let's get rid of that excess hair. Huh. Yeah. Look at all of this. Oh, man. Reaping a rich harvest. Blankets out of this fur, huh? Yeah. Feed my children <laughs> with by selling blankets made from your excess fur. What do you think, sweetie pie? Look at all that. Look at all that. Yeah. Wow. Wowza. Maybe I'll be a cat rancher, huh? Yeah. Get all that cat fur. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Good stuff. You want some more brushing? Get that light going. Oh, there you go. Okay. See you later, sweetie pie. Well, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for stopping by. Yes, indeed. That's one of my landlords, chat. Sweetie Pie. She actually used to belong to Snail Chaser before he moved to a new place. And now she lives here. She moved in here before I did. She lives with Ios and Lordy and their two cats. So we've got three cats, three people. It's a good place to be. Yeah. Anyway, back to the chicken from hell. Anzu Wiley Eye. You're looking at Anzu Wiley Eye, a fossil from the age of dinosaurs. And yes, despite some very bird-like features, Anzu is a dinosaur. To know the difference, oh, we look at dinosaurs. physical traits. Like some modern birds, for example, the cassowary, Anzu had a crest on its head. It had a yep. long, flexible neck and a toothless beak that helped it gather small prey or plants. It was covered in feathers and had long legs for fast running. It even had a furcula or wishbone which yep. traditionally is thought of as a bird trait. However, that long bony tail, those big hooked sharp hand claws, those are dinosaur traits. To be specific, 
Onzu is a type of dinosaur called an oviraptorosaur. Yep. Onzu was quite a remarkable find. For almost 100 years, paleontologists had only found bits of skeletons of oviraptorosaurs in North America. But in the late 1990s and early 2000s, several paleontologists working on what they thought were different types of dinosaurs realized they were in fact working on the same type. Yep. One of those paleontologists is our own Dr. Matt Lamana, Associate Curator of Vertebrate Paleontology. Oh, is he one of the Dr. describers Lamana of led the team Anzu? that had the honor of naming Anzu Wileyi. The Very name cool. Anzu referred Very to cool. a bird-like demon in Mesopotamian mythology. You hmm. can see why. And the bird dinosaur question? Well, this is about as close to a bird as you can be and still be a dinosaur. Sort of. Dromaeosaurs are probably a little bit closer, but yeah, that's why she said about as close as you can be, I guess. There is also a chance that oh, Manoraptorans legitimately are birds. We don't really know what's going on at the base of the bird family tree. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, good stuff. Um, good stuff indeed. And with all of that having been done, and talking about bird-like dinosaurs, why don't we talk about this piece of Fossil News, which uh, just came out yesterday. Without further ado, let's jump into some Fossil News. Let's do it. All right, our top story for the day on Fossil News. Feathered dinosaurs. Small feathered dinosaurs flapped their proto wings to scare a hiding prey, colon, study. I've not actually looked at this yet, nor have I read the paper, so this is going to be a live kind of... I don't know, we're going to explore this together. Live. How does that sound? Numerous non-avian dinosaurs, so non-bird dinosaurs, possessed panaceous feathers. Those are feathers that have a central rachis to them, a central shaft, a central quill to the feather. Numerous non-avian dinosaurs possessed panaceous feathers on their proto-wings and tail. Their functions remain unclear. Seoul National University researcher Jin Sok Park and colleagues proposed that these panaceous feathers were used in displays to flush hiding prey through stimulation of sensory neural escape pathways in prey, allowing the dinosaurs to pursue the flushed prey. Interesting. Interesting. Um. Yeah. Well, let's hear them out. Let's see what they have to say about this. The early function of panaceous feathers remains unclear, Park and co-authors said. Over the past three decades, spectacular dinosaur fossils with diverse feather types have been discovered. Among these fossils, panaceous feathers, the type of feathers that is act adaptively modified for flying in modern birds, are limited to Panoraptora. So Panoraptora, there's a clade right here that is... I think this is the group of Manoraptoran dinosaurs that includes Oviraptorosaurs, Dromaeosaurs, Ornithomimosaurs. No, not Ornithomimosaurs. And, and Avialans. What is this? The most recent common ancestor of Oviraptor, Deinonychus, and the house sparrow, Passer domesticus. Okay, so it's Dromaeosaurs, Oviraptorosaurs, and modern birds. Okay, cool. That's Peneraptora, that clade. The earliest panaceous feathers were present on the distal forelimbs as small proto-wings and around the tip of the tail as distant caudal plumage in the early diverging Peneraptorans, as preserved in Caudipteryx. Caudipteryx is a really important feathered dinosaur from Liaoning in China. 
beautiful feathers we have from this critter. Would have looked something like that. A little feathery theropod. It's been revealed to have been an overapterosaur. Yeah, not too shabby. It's a beautiful one from Gabriella Guetto, right there. Codipteryx, not a particularly large animal. There it is next to a domestic house cat. Felis catus. Yeah. That mother says, I read about this and was curious about your perspective on it. I've not read about it yet, so we're doing that right now. You're going to get my perspective. The earliest pinaceous feathers were present on the distal forelimbs, so for the end of the arms, as small proto-wings, and around the tip of the tail as distant caudal plumage and early diverging peneraptorians as preserved in codipteryx. Proto-wings were too small to be used for powered flight. The functions of proto-wings and caudal plumage, that's tail feathers, caudal plumage is tail feathers, might have been related to foraging or hunting or other behaviors. The authors hypothesized that proto-wings may have been used for flush pursuit foraging, a hunting strategy observed in multiple species of contemporary... Holy cow! J. Marianne... Speaking of feathered theropods here, take a look at these. G. Marianne has arrived in force with their army of 111 chickens. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing, J. Marianne. It is good to have you here. It is great to have you here. Really fits. Welcome, welcome, J. Marianne, to Paleontologizing. How did your stream go? I hope it was excellent. And this is a dinosaur too. And welcome, Raiders. A real mean kid. Um, with six inch daggers for teeth, eclectic eclecticism on gray, null mage, dusty, or not the work of vertebrate Legit paleontologists, uh, Plabowski, little sill, scientician, and pure uh, skill. Tell you that in nature, one... Thank you for the follows and welcome to paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Holy cow, you're smart. What do you think? do a research I, on that, I, Oliver. I, I never... Uh, welcome, welcome, everybody. Holy cow. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about dinosaurs, about natural history, about extinction and evolution and biodiversity, about the... The incredible story of life on our planet Earth. That's what I talk about here. Jay Marianne, I hope you had a wonderful stream. It is good to have you here. And thank you to Pure Skill, Little Sill, pa Paw, Wall, Riot Vision, Only Ash. I'm a high school student aspiring to be a paleontologist. Any tips or advice? Oh, you bet. Stay tuned. What havoc will they wreak? What in another raid? Will they destroy? What depths of panic and terror will they create? Jeanette V, thank you for this the raid there. Holy cow. It's a double raid here. Extraordinary. Welcome, welcome back, Jeanette V and Raiders to Paleontologizing. It's wonderful to have you here. How did your stream go, Jeanette V? Howdy. Howdy. Again, for those of you who might be new here. Allow me to uh, introduce myself real briefly here. Oh, we got to reactivate our camera there. There we go. Um, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, and I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. Dinosaurs are what I study, what I publish on in the scientific literature, what I dig up during the summers. This past summer, we were digging up dinosaur fossils live on stream. Very excited to be doing that again this next summer in Wyoming and Utah, so stay tuned for that. But, uh, yeah. When I'm not out in the field, I'm broadcasting from my office here in the beautiful, sunny San Francisco Bay Area. Um, talking about fossils. 
So anyway, with that having been said, I figure this is a perfect time for a quick little welcome video with a good friend of ours, previously recorded Danny, who is currently stinking up behind me right now. He is very eager. So we're not going to dally here. We're going to let him... Hang on! Goodness, I know you're excited. You got two big raids. He's incorrigible. Um... I'm going to introduce you to a good friend of ours, previously recorded Danny. He's going to tell you a thing or two about who I am, what I'm doing here, what a paleontologist is doing here on Twitch. And, uh, so yeah, holy cow, Jen and, uh, and Jay Marianne, I appreciate you both very, very much for your raids. Here comes previously recorded Danny to, uh, to introduce you to the channel. Previously recorded Danny? The floor is yours. Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you happen to be new around here, then welcome to paleontologizing. You may well be wondering to yourself, uh, well, if this is Twitch, then where are the video games? I'm gonna level with you here. I don't really do much in the way of video games. I'm a paleontologist. My name is Danny Anduza, and dinosaurs are my area of study. does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, you're about to find out. When I finished high school, I moved to Montana and immediately started work at the Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was an unparalleled powerhouse of paleobiology. That program was built by this guy. Famed paleontologist Alan Grant. Well, Kind of. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Jack Horner, the real-life Alan Grant. He's one of the most prominent and controversial paleontologists in the country, a dyslexic MacArthur Foundation genius who never finished college and who says he doesn't care why dinosaurs went extinct. To him, the important part is how they lived. It was at Museum of the Rockies, under the auspices of Jack Horner, that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. And a huge part of that I learned by working with Jack's final graduate student, a guy by the name of Denver Fowler, who would later go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Working with Denver, I did summer after summer of fieldwork in the remote Badlands of Montana. Together, we dug up more dinosaurs than we knew what to do with, and fossil sites numbering in the hundreds. In 2012, I discovered a new species of ceratopsian dinosaur, hopefully soon to be published. The next year, we excavated the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. Then, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. Not bad, right? Well, anyway, much like my fieldwork, my research also focuses on dinosaurs. For example, here's Triarchuncus, the last of the alvarosaurs, just published in July of 2020. One of my current projects focuses on spinosaurids. Really talk too much about that until it's a little bit closer to publication, so uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things in Montana were declining rapidly, so I picked up and moved on to greener pastures. I'm so glad I did. And with that new perspective, I also realized that I have very little patience with the soul crushing bureaucracy within academia. For the time being, anyway, I decided to take my career in a slightly different direction. I got hired for a job in early childhood education. As a teacher, I get to have a positive impact on kids' lives, to help them find a passion for science. Then, when COVID-19 showed up, the school had to close. But that didn't stop the teaching or the learning. We just moved online. All right, friends. 
So we're going to be looking at a book in a little bit, but I thought we'd start off with a song. At three, two, two. one. <laughs> oh, give me a home where the hadrosaurs roamed, where triceratops bellowed and grazed, where erosion uncovers bones we seek to discover, for to strike the whole world amazing. Seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. It was a pretty easy jump from teaching online to streaming on Twitch. I had my first broadcast in May, and I've been on here ever since. Now I believe pretty strongly that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about her science is one of the most important things that a researcher can do. I now have a golden opportunity to reach out directly to people where they are. This is what I'm all about. And now, thanks to Twitch, I get to share it with you. And I'm so happy to be able to do so. It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help by following, or if you could afford it, by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So anyway, to my regular viewers, thank you again for sitting through this. And to everybody who's new, welcome. I'm genuinely, earnestly glad that you're here. And I hope you stick around. We've got a remarkable little community here, and i uh, be delighted if you join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny? Back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded the Danny. Ponderous Cracodon. And 32 feet long and 14 feet high. Sweet and sauerkraut. What a great name. And not a single. <laughs> thank you for the follow. Not a single cavity is what that alert was supposed to have said. And uh, it did. This Let's is get our during a Jurassic Park. music started. Digging again up here. dinosaurs is hard, frustrating work. It takes months or years. So leave it to the professionals. And Lucas Dawn, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much to J. Marianne and Janen V for those those raids. Really appreciate that. And Legit Savage is just subscribed at tier one. Legit Savage, thank you, thank you. You are legit. That name is not a mistake. Thank you, thank you. For that pledge of ongoing support that means a lot to me legit savage that means you'll also get access to uh to these emotes here welcome to another edition of lifestyles of the large and extinct and uh bella Messina, thank you for the follow welcome welcome it's good to have you here holy cow uh good stuff good stuff how can i not sub this is so cool thank you legit savage that means a lot to me yeah uh, one of the things that that video didn't mention is that, uh, since that video is a little old, I'm working on some new ones. This past summer, I was able to broadcast live from the field, and you can see some of these streams on YouTube. Uh, so yeah, digging up dinosaurs live in the field. Hey, a dinosaur! <laughs> Uh, Mr. Psychopomp, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Here we go. This there is my... Go. I think that did it. This is from July 25th, All right. 2023. Mm -hmm. And Anybody Old Girl Honeybun, thank right you for now? the follow. Let me know. Yeah. And thanks, Sparrow Cat. Testing, yeah, they keep testing. the sun out of the eyes. You see or hear me. Astonishing. Simply astonishing. One of the most singular specimens I've encountered in all my distinguished career. Lucky Jeffy, what thank you. About my work? What did you want to show me? Um, <laughs> Lucky Jeffy, thanks for the follow. See you uh, Thank you, SolarPod. Beautiful. All right, excellent. Welcome to Paleontologizing, everybody. It is wonderful to have you here. Welcome back to the desert of eastern Utah. 
It's very hot out today, a little bit cooler than yesterday, actually, which is really nice. We are continuing work down there in the quarry. There's actually some plastering going on, so let's go check that out. Um, if, it's, if you're here for the very first time, then uh, extra special welcome to you. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You heard all this already. And I stream fossil science here on Twitch. Um, I'm here with a crew of paleontologists and volunteers out here in the Cedar Mountain Formation, earliest Cretaceous of eastern Utah. Broadcasting and you to get used to it, Triceratops. Right you get used to it. There's the dish and the router and the solar panels. So, yeah, uh, out here in the remote badlands of eastern Utah, there's no cell service, there's no Wi-Fi, nothing like that. So I had to broadcast via satellite. And uh, we were really lucky to be able to do that. Panels. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, without further ado, let's just go look at the plastering that's going on currently. We're going to catch the tail end of it, it looks like. So, yeah, we were doing this last summer, and I am slated to do this again this summer. And the guy right there in the cowboy hat, Ethan Cowgill, just texted me today to say that we're going to be starting our field work in Wyoming this year at, like, the beginning of June. Sometime around June 1st. Very excited for that. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Nice. So we had a rib under there. Yeah. So gypsonas are these kind of pre-plastered... Medical bandages, bandages, medical bandages. So we put, we're just, this is just to protect it as we get ready to hack more rock around it to make a bigger pedestal to do a plaster and burlap jacket. Yeah. Um, so that's so Utah Assistant sort of State way. Paleontologist Don DeBlue right there in the baseball cap. The Called a layer of separator, like separator. some of you saw earlier in the summer when we were in we'll Wyoming. To, uh, and by leaving a little rock exposed, I'll get the gypsum to actually stick to the rock. Yeah. So yeah, so this is some smaller scale jacketing. We did some larger scale jacketing uh, in Wyoming. Let's find a jacketing stream here. Um, here, check this out. Yeah, here's me helping uh, build this protective cocoon around a hadrosaur limb bone so that we could bring it back to the laboratory safely without it falling apart. And I don't know why, but for whatever reason, my microphone on the camera really amplifies the sounds, the kind of squishy, squelchy noises of the plaster. It really picks those up preferentially. I don't know why. It doesn't sound nearly this loud in real life, but people in chat were calling it plaster ASMR, and, uh, yeah... Let's see. Is this the same plaster as for broken limbs? I think this is like architectural plaster. Um, I don't know if that's the same kind as for broken limbs. Do they still use plaster for uh, for broken limb bones in people? I'm not sure. Uh, there you go, wheel six two. Yeah, it's definitely a similar, con <laughs> you know, same idea. Are these plastic now for. For broken limb casts. Interesting, Sparky Pugwash. Huh. But yeah, for whatever reason, that microphone loved the sounds of this plaster. It's not nearly as loud in real life. I could barely hear it in real life. The microphone just picks it up yeah. referentially. It loves that sound. Depends on your insurance, says Clearbur. <laughs> there you go. Good stuff. All right, looking good. And I gotta find some more boots like this for this field season. Or no, those are the boots I have now. I gotta find more of my Daner pronghorns. See if those go on sale at any point before the field season this year. But it looks like we're gonna have at least two whole months of field work this summer. And there is an exothermic reaction. It's not three or four. Yes, indeed. Um, sorry, I can't see your username. It's a little dark. Yeah. Um, and Pope says, what is this fossil of? This is of a duckbill dinosaur. We don't know what kind yet. It's probably a new species. 
So, um, yeah. Here. Uh, this kind of dinosaur would be a lot like this. I don't know how gigantic it is, but... What? Pumpkin Lantern Looney. I don't know why that alert is so common today. But Pumpkin Lantern Looney, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologize. It's good to have you here. Yeah. So this kind of dinosaur. We don't actually know if this is a hadrosaurine or sorolophine hadrosaur or a lambiosaurine. Like, uh... Lambiosaurine hadrosaurs tend to have these big honking crests on them like this. Lambiosaurus is a good example. There's Tilotilophus, another good example. Lambiosaurines. Um, Lambiosaurus right there. Yeah, we don't know precisely what kind of hadrosaur, but some kind of big duck-billed dinosaur. Um... And the reason that we don't know what kind it is, is because just about any dinosaur that we find here is going to be new. Because we were digging in the Almond Formation. and the Almond Formation of Wyoming, there are zero dinosaurs that have been named from the Almond Formation. Uh, the Almond stretches from the Late Campanian to maybe the Early Maastrichtian? of Wyoming, so late Cretaceous period, so indeterminate, 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 indeterminate. We don't know, yeah, Perionicodon, we don't, we don't really know that. Um, unnamed Chasmosaurian Ceratopsid, we found a Ceratopsid in the Almond last year. Just about any dinosaur we find there is going to be brand new, which is really exciting. Because this is a sequence of rocks that represents a time that's unknown so far. I'll show you a geologic time chart, chronostratigraphic charts. So this is when we talk about the age of the Earth. You know, where you chatters are right up here in this these black pixels at the very top of this. So am I, at the very top of the Cenozoic era. Um, this is the Age of Mammals. It started 66 million years ago when that asteroid struck and wiped out all the dinosaurs, except for birds. Here's the Mesozoic. Here's the Cretaceous period. Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops and Pachycephalosaurus and Ankylosaurus. They all lived here in the Upper Maastrichtian Epoch of the Upper Cretaceous period of the Mesozoic Era. The Maastrichtian. The Almond Formation, where we were digging in Wyoming this last summer, the Almond Formation kind of straddles the boundary between the Campanian Epoch and the Maastrichtian Epoch. So it's about maybe 72, 73 million years old, something like that. We're, uh, we're still kind of figuring that out. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And James DM says, what is the process for naming a new species? Oh boy, that's a good question, James DM, and I'm glad you asked it. I'm very glad you asked it. Let's let's get into that, shall we? You know what? This is a good example. This is a 3D model that I've sculpted and then printed of a dinosaur called Trirarchuncus. This is one of my very, very favorite dinosaurs because it's the first dinosaur, the first new dinosaur that I was an author on for the original descriptive paper. Trirarchuncus. The name means Captain Hook of the Prairie. And, um... Here, just to give you a sense for what this animal is like, I'm going to play a quick video for you, and then we'll get into... Then we'll get into this dinosaur, but... I'll show you a video of a very close relative of this animal from Mongolia. The animal you're about to see in this video might be the ancestor of Trirarchuncus. Check it out. Mononychus is a desert specialist. Mononychus. 
Such hypersensitive directional hearing gives her a mental map of this hollow log. And what lies within? Yeah. So, kind of owl-like, right? Yeah, there you go, Sparky Bogosh, yeah. Yeah. She now uses the weapon that gives this hunter its name. Mononychus. <laughs> Single giant claw. Yeah. Just what she needs to open a termite's nest. Uh-oh, watch out, termites. You're gonna get got. And she has another special piece of equipment. Yeah, we don't really know if they had this. Probably. Tongues don't fossilize very easily. But yeah. An excellent protein-packed meal. If only termites weren't quite so irritating. Yeah. <laughs> That's Mononychus right there creature that would have looked something like this. There's another depiction from another artist that's got these ridiculously short forelimbs. Now, how do we name a new dinosaur? How does that work? I'm here to walk you through that. And that's why we bring up this animal as an example. Um, this is pretty cool because I was watching a video um, let's see... Hutchins. There we go. Um, here is a really cool video, a lecture by paleontologist John Hutchinson here. And actually, let me f try, and, try and find another video, kind of introduce him. We're, we're going down a real rabbit hole here. Um, John Hutchinson, dinosaur. Um, let's see, scrolling, scrolling. Hey man, YouTube keeps showing me all these videos that are not what I'm looking for. But, I'll try this. Chickens, living dinosaurs, and so the subject of that. Is... Yeah, so here's John Hutchinson here. Um. Anyway, YouTube is being really finicky, but here he is. He's going to talk about this animal, about Triarchuncus before it was named. Take a look. A little bit more light-hearted questions, and then we'll finish up. Um... So yeah, he's giving this lecture, and he's asking for questions from the audience. And then one of the questions was as follows. It was, what is your favorite dinosaur? First of all, the classic question, what is your favorite dinosaur? Um, well, I have to say T-Rex is one of them, but because uh, I've worked on T-Rex and it's, it's cool, I admit. But, um, but I also, uh, the only dinosaur I ever discovered was a little tiny bird-like dinosaur called an Alvarez saurid. Uh, from the Hell Creek Formation of Montana. It was in a museum drawer at Berkeley. Yep. Um, and I discovered a little bit of its hip bone, and then the hip bones were so distinct, I knew exactly what it was. And uh, they're, they're really cool animals. They're only about this big, with stubby little arms. You saw that animal long, long earlier with the claws. And a long tail, and they were feathered. Uh, really cool things that people think maybe dug in anthills, because they had these big stubby arms and little tiny heads with very sharp needle-like teeth. I still don't know what they did. They're, they're mysterious animals, but they're, they're really, really cool. And the fact that I, that I found a piece of one that uh, I didn't get to name, but at least it's, it's some sort of new animal from Montana, that makes it one of my favorite dinosaurs. So he said he didn't get to name it. And what he should have said was, I decided to appeal to the better angels of my nature and not name it. <laughs> because 
He could have named it. Other paleontologists have named dinosaurs based on much more scrappy elements than that. Much more fragmentary remains. But. But. In 1987, I think it was, John Hutchinson published this paper saying we've got an Alvarasaurid from the Hell Creek. We only have a few elements from it, but we're not going to name it yet. We know it's an Alvarasaurid dinosaur. Hutchinson. Uh, I'm trying to find the paper right now on my hard drive. 42 Ashtray, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Hutchinson, 1987 maybe? Is that going to bring it up? Was it 1988? Um, there it is. No, 1998. Wow, later than I thought. Here it is. So this is that original scientific paper. Yeah, the first known Alvarasaurid from North America. Uh, by John Hutchinson and Luis Chiappe. Yeah. Good stuff. I really ought to bring John Hutchinson on here as an interviewee on this channel. Talk to him about Triarchuncus. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So this is the original descriptive paper. This is what he found. So this is the uh, the pubic bone right here. And I have photographed this from every angle. We came here to find fossils. Handy dandy, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Yeah. Um, so just from this one bone, he was able to realize this is an Alvarezaurid dinosaur. This is a group of dinosaurs. That is known from South America and from Mongolia. And from China now, too. These little... Stilty... Probably insect-eating dinosaurs have been found in other places around the world. Here's Shuvuya Desertai from Mongolia. And just from that very distinctive uh, hip bone there, John Hutchinson was able to determine, hey, holy cow, this... This is from this kind of dinosaur, and it's the first one ever found in North America. And he could... He could have decided to name it, give it a new name based on a single bone like this. And he decided not to. Well, actually, there's there's two bones here. There's a, a pubis and a partial ischium, which is another hip bone. He could have, you know, if he had been unscrupulous, he could have named a totally new dinosaur based on this one little element. But that's kind of bad practice, so he didn't do it. Then later, years later, this is 1998 that he published that paper. Years later, I was in the field, in the Hell Creek Formation, in eastern Montana, with Denver Fowler and Jack Wilson. And Jack Wilson, I still remember this day like, like it was yesterday. Jack Wilson, I see him like running across the prairie and I'm like, what the heck? Oh no, Jack, did you get bitten by a rattlesnake or something like, why are you, oh, what's going on? Why are you running toward us right now? And he comes over and he's all out of breath and he's like, Look! And he opens up his hand, and there, in his hand, is a fossil claw. I'll show you. Here we go. We, we kind of chronic chronicled it in this little book right here. Uh... The find of the summer, Denver called it. What did 
that go? There's a Triceratops that I found. Microsites. Find of the summer. Here we are. This is the claw that Jack Wilson found. Find of the summer. That claw right there. Of an Alvarasaurid. And there's the little, the quick little doodle that I did of this animal to include in this book before we had it printed. Yeah, we are currently preparing a scientific paper describing this and two other Alvarasaurid claws from Montana. Thank you, JNEWC2, for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And so, we were able to, to say, shoot, this is definitely an Alvarasaurid claw. They're very, very distinctive. So this, and two other claw fossils, allowed us to finally name this animal. We could finally give the Alvarasaurid from the Hell Creek Formation, we could finally give it a name. And so, there's the three claws right there. There's the one that Jack found. This is actually a cast of it in resin. There's a smaller Alvarasaurid claw, and a larger one. We were able to determine these are all probably from the same animal at different growth stages. And, uh, yeah. The new fossils represent a growth series from juvenile to adult, said lead author Dr. Denver Fowler of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum and colleagues. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, Trirarchuncus prairiensis, which is what this dinosaur is now called, is the youngest known alvarosaurid and one of the la very last dinosaurs which went extinct during the end Cretaceous mass extinction event. This is what we think the animal looked like. You know, this is like a... We're just depicting what an alvarosaurid may have looked like. This is actually a physical model that you can see at the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in Dickinson, North Dakota. This is a physical sculpt with actual feathers on it from, uh, from an emu and from a turkey. So yeah. It looks like a painting, says Claire Brew. Well, this is a photograph. This is a photograph of a physical model of Trirarchuncus. Here. Um, Trirarchuncus prairiensis. Yeah, the reason this looks like a physical model is because it literally is. There it is there. Yeah. In a display case. You can see this in... Dickinson, North Dakota. Yeah. It's giving Fraggle vibes, says MLF. <laughs> yeah, I remember Denver saying, when he was instructing the artist on how to make this, he's like, I want it to be looking up at you. So like, so it's like, it's, it's your weird little buddy, you know? You look down and it looks right back up at you. <laughs> Yeah, Trirarchuncus. Um, I would have made it a little bit more brightly colored if it were up to me, but then you'd have to paint the feathers on it, you know? This artist just used emu feathers and turkey feathers up here. Maybe quail feathers, too. But, uh, yeah. It's an animal about this big. And so the name Trirarchuncus means gonna say in here, right? I don't want to give it away. Uh, oh shoot, they don't actually say in this article. The name means Captain Hook. Trirarchuncus prairiensis, Captain Hook of the Prairie. Here's an artist who uh, decided to kind of play with that idea a little bit. Uh, Trurarcuncus prairiensis, Captain Hook of the Prairie. So yeah, yar indeed, leg kick, yeah, yeah. Um, a really cool critter, Trurarcuncus. Anyway, the reason that we knew that it was new is because sometimes when you find a dinosaur that's, it's clearly, a uh, like, it's from a, a well-known dinosaur family, but you find it in a new time and a new place. Like, you find it 
in the Hell Creek Formation of Montana. It's going to be new. Species don't stay the same. They change over time. That's evolution, you know? So we found an alvarosaur in the Hell Creek Formation of Montana at the very end of the Age of Dinosaurs. And we could tell that it was new. Here's that paper in the Journal of Cretaceous Research. Trirarchuncus prairiensis. The last alvarosaurid. Hell Creek Formation, Uppermost Mastrichtian, Montana. And there, who's this dingus right here? That's me. One of the authors on this paper. I, uh... My big contribution to this paper was, uh... Was... Well, really, it was looking through the, the rest of the collections at UCMP and Berkeley and trying to find any other scraps of this animal and photographing the bits that John Hutchinson described back in 1998. So that we had really, really good photographic, you know, we had good photographs of this animal so that Denver could compare it. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, when we're naming a new dinosaur, basically you have to do, you have to determine that this animal is different from other creatures that are close relatives. So in this case, here, you look at the diagnosis. So, phylogenetic analysis, geology and stratigraphy, uh, description. Oh, here, so here's, yeah, Badlands Dinosaur Museum of Specimens. Distal end of the left radian. So basically, you do like a really, really detailed anatomical description, and you say this is different from every other dinosaur, even close relatives, that have ever been published on before. And you talk about the exact details of the anatomy that make it different and distinct and new. Uh, so the flexor tubical locus of this specimen is developed as two bulbous rugose mounds bisected by the ventral sulcus. This is the most extensive development of the flexor tubical locus. The three ungules described here as well as compared to other alvarosaurids, which commonly lack development of the flexor tubical or exhibit only slight inflation at the flexor tubical locus. The ventral sulcus is at its widest at its proximal end, forming, forming a delta-like notch between the mound-shaped flexor tubicles. Immediately distal to the flexor tubicles, the ventral sulcus is initially laterally constricted and then widens slightly before shallowing in depth distally. The ventral foramina are asymmetrical in size and location, with the left foramen being larger and more proximately placed on the right. There is an additional small foramen medial to the right fo groove foramen of BDM001. Um, this is what we're talking about here. So, like, you get really, really in-depth descriptions of the particular anatomical characteristics of these individual bones that when we're naming a new dinosaur you've got to prove basically in writing that this dinosaur has got features that no other dinosaur has if you want to justify naming a new species or genus you've got to say hey this is what makes it distinct this is what makes it different It's not easy work. You've got to learn a lot of anatomy to be able to do this. But that's what it takes to name a new dinosaur. The fact that this dinosaur also comes from a different time horizon makes that a lot easier. You know? If you've got an, a, a very similar dinosaur from the same time and place as other very similar dinosaurs, but there's just a few very subtle differences that make it new, I'm going to be very suspicious of that. I'm going to be like, why aren't those new differences just the result of ontogeny or stratigraphy? How do we really know that this thing is new? But Trirarchuncus here, this little dinosaur is from a different time and a different place. And why did ontogeny. that not work? Come on now. There we go. 
Yeah. So it's from a different time and a different place. By all means, it should be a different dinosaur, because dinosaurs are constantly evolving. It should be a new kind of dinosaur. And it was. So there you go. Yeah. Um. Oh, and Kodali, thank you for reposting that from uh, J. Marianne. How does the shift of land masses like Pangaea and its predecessors impact fossils or discoveries like these? Oh, but you just asked a question that I could take weeks to answer, J. Marianne. Holy cow, is that a good question? The shifting of land masses, what we call paleo biogeography, how shifting land masses in the ancient world change how creatures spread and adapt and evolve and everything else. There are people who write their entire doctoral theses, you know, about this kind of thing. It's a huge question. It's a huge question. Yeah, it's a great question. It would take... Oh, man. I'm gonna... I'm gonna shelve that for this moment. Let's put that on the shelf for right now. And let's talk about ontogeny for a brief second here because we've got a bunch of new people who are new to this idea. Sweet and sauerkraut has got a, a question. Fair enough, it could be metamorphosis, right? Or what we call in paleontology ontogeny. So, ontogeny. Ontogeny, yes. Ontogeny, ontogeny is the process by which creatures change during their individual lifespans. Tradu so like one individual animal, like a, a triceratops, ontogeny. as it grows and matures, its body is going to change a lot in shape and in size. And for triceratops, ontogeny. we used to have like 20 species of triceratops named. And then we slowly kind of began to realize that... Ontogeny. These are mostly changes in ontogeny. They look very different at different growth stages like this, like you see right here. Ontogeny. And so, what we used to think was diversity of species, it turns out it's just diversity of body form for the same animals as they grow and mature. Ontogeny is hugely important. And that was one of the coolest parts of this paper, honestly, was, uh, was figuring out that, uh... Oh, uh-oh. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Wrong button, sorry. <laughs> um, I was trying to click this to bring us to this. Um, yeah, we've got three different claws from this animal. And, uh... Mark Melbourne gifted a tier one sub to Sweet on Zorkro. Thank you, Mark Melbourne. Subs in the channel. So we've got... three different claws of this animal. Ontogeny. And if... if our group of scientists, Denver Fowler and Liz Friedman Fowler and Chris Noto and Jack Horner and myself... And, and Jack Wilson, if we had all decided that, like, oh, well, you know, these claws all, all look different from each other. Yes, they're different sizes, but, you know, they all look different. This must be three different species. We could have made that argument. And we could have named three different alvarosaurs from the Hell Creek Formation because we've got three claws. And they're three different sizes and they're slightly different shapes. That must mean that they're different species. But this is the thing, is that we know Ontogeny. that dinosaurs changed shape a lot throughout their lifespan. Ontogeny, like we were talking about here. Ontogeny. And so we realized the smart thing to do is just, is it probably the same animal? We'll name them as the same species for now. Maybe in the future we'll find dozens of dozens more specimens and it'll turn out that we've got three different species. But for right now, the most parsimonious thing to do, the most logical thing to do scientifically, is to name them all as the same species for now. So yeah, yeah.
Does that make sense? If you cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. Which is a Tyrannosaurus' favorite type of takeout? Rex Mix. There you go, Nell. Thank you for the 100 bits. I appreciate that. Yeah. And parsimonious. Wonderful. Yeah, that's a word that we use a lot in science. Parsimony. Parsimonious. Yeah. Glad you appreciate that, sweet and sauerkraut. So for those of you who are new, there's actually a lovely introduction to this sort of thing. Um, here. Um, since we've got a bunch of cool new people here, let's take a look at this video. I know we do this. We've done this a few times before on this channel, but let's get back into it. Here's a TED Talk with my old boss, Jack Horner, here. Talking about the idea of ontogeny in dinosaurs and how that affects our idea of dinosaur biodiversity. This is good stuff. Yeah. Tara asked for a show of hands or a clapping of people in different generations. I'm interested in how many are 3 to 12 years old. <laughs> no, no. Cowboy man, I've not heard about that, no. no. All right, well, I'm going to talk about dinosaurs. Do you remember dinosaurs when you were that age? Okay. Dinosaurs are kind of funny, I mean, you know. We're going to kind of go in a different direction right now. I hope you all realize that, right? So I'll just give you my message up front. Try not to go extinct. That's it. Yeah. People ask me a lot. Um, one of, in fact, one of the most asked questions I get is, why do children like dinosaurs so much? I mean, what, what's the fascination? I've got my own ideas about this. I usually just say, well, you know, dinosaurs were big, different, and gone. They're all gone. Yeah. Well, that's not true, but we'll get to the goose in a minute. So, yeah, birds that's sort are of living the theme. Dinosaurs. Big, different, and gone. The title of my talk, Shape-Shifting Dinosaurs, The Cause for a Premature Extinction. Hmm. Now, I assume that we remember dinosaurs and you know, there's lots of different... I mean, let's just, the better question is, why don't, why aren't adults more interested in dinosaurs? And I think that's because, um, well, that's like a societal thing. I mean, shoot. Society is built in such a way to, I don't know, modern capitalist society is built in such a way that people are forced to work at jobs that they hate, that do not enrich themselves, they enrich the wealthy. People are beaten down. People are depressed. People are... If something is not profitable for the wealthy ruling class, then it has no no place in modern society, right? And dinosaurs don't make me money. Exactly, Axeman. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, and legit salvage. You're more right than you know. Yes. Absolutely. A comrade there. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's, it's what really frustrates me as a scientist and as somebody who does science outreach full time is that like a huge part of the American education system seems to be to train people to be in the workforce and beat out of them any kind of creativity, curiosity, enthusiasm for learning, any critical thinking that they might have, any... passion that they have for the natural world. You know, that doesn't enrich the stockholders. It doesn't increase the stock price. Incredibly frustrating. You know? I say, feed the stockholders to the crocodiles. Let's learn about the natural world. Let's watch how those crocodiles eat. I'm sure we can learn something from that. You know? That'd be cool. Let's do an experiment. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I have... Gotta be careful what you say in a place like this, because 
you know, I don't know. Twitch is owned by Amazon, and... Uh, you know, it's just... Uh, it's one of those things where... You know, you got to be careful. You got to be careful what you say. And... Hey, where did that go? Hang on a second. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know how it is, everybody. You gotta be careful what you say, because they'll... If you're not making profit for the man... <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, this is a safe place. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Here. Let's, <laughs> uh, let's, let's, let's get back to our video. Uh, yeah. I assume that we remember <laughs> dinosaurs and, you know, there's... You know, anyway, the point that I was making is that, like, dinosaurs are intensely interesting. And, like, why aren't more adults interested in dinosaurs? And it's just that, like, in our society, adults are not encouraged to be interested in things unless they're profitable. Things like professional sports or consumer goods or, you know, buying products and stuff like that. And dinosaurs are just not necessarily commercially viable like that and the same way that like bird watching is not something that there's not like a national tournament of bird watchers or you know that's like televised or anything like that because it's like well how do you monetize that you know uh, the natural world often stands in the way of profits of enriching the shareholders of you know, paving over paradise and, uh, you know, helping business executives get their fifth vacation home, you know? So, yeah, except for selling dinosaur toys, but even then, Cast the Dreamer, it's... Yeah, even then, you see a lot of garbage, you know? Like, not a lot of scientifically authentic dinosaur toys, there is a market for that in like museums and stuff like that, but yeah, anyway, it's again, yeah, we'll be talking about AI and uh, AI dinosaur art next week, so stay tuned for that. But for now, let's let's get back into this. Lots of different shapes, different, lots of different kinds. A long time ago, back in the early 1900s, and cool, Emily. That's cool. That's cool. Looking for dinosaurs, they went out and gathered them up. And this is an interesting story. Every museum wanted a little bigger or better one than anybody else had. So, if the museum in Toronto went out and collected a tyrannosaur, a big one, then the museum in Ottawa wanted a bigger one and a better one. Yep. And that happened for all the museums. So everyone was out looking for all these bigger and better dinosaurs. And Bearbold, I'm this glad you like this TED Talk. Yeah. By about 1970, some scientists... Red Tail Hawks, very cool. Gas, very cool. What in the world? Look at these dinosaurs. They're all big. Where are all the little ones? Where indeed. And they thought about it, and they even wrote papers about it. Where are the little dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> well, go to a museum, you'll see. See how many baby dinosaurs there are. Not very many. 
people assumed, and, so, and this was actually a problem. So Jack Horner kind of made his career digging up baby dinosaurs. Like, and they're, it turns out they're not actually rare if you know where to look and, and what to look for. Baby dinosaurs are not extraordinarily difficult to find. They're out there. You just have to go find them. Uh, where are they, says Mariel? Well, let's continue. Problem. People assume that if they had MLF, little yeah. dinosaurs, <laughs> if they had juvenile dinosaurs, they'd uh, be easy to identify. You'd have a big dinosaur and a littler dinosaur. <laughs> but all they had were big dinosaurs. And it comes down to a couple of things. First off, scientists have egos. And it's true. We are we are human beings. We are fallible. We are not machines. We're not computers. We're not Vulcans. We've got egos. You know? As much as we as scientists, you know, as long as we would like to be, as much as we would like to be, um, you know, uh, Commander Spock, we're usually much more like Captain Kirk in that sense. You know? We're human. We have egos. We have feelings. We like to name things. We like to name dinosaurs. Scientists like to name dinosaurs. Yeah. They like to name anything. And Ren Melian, thank you for the raid. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Two raiders. Yeah, it's good to have you here, Red Melian. How did your stream go? Welcome back. It's good to see you. How have you been? Tell me how things are. We'll continue with this. It's good to have you here. Everybody likes to have their own. Hey, hello to you too. Welcome, welcome. Named. And so. <laughs> and so every time they found something that looked a little different, they named it something different. And this is what I was talking about. Shoot, with uh, with this paper here by John Hutchinson. Remember we were looking at this video right here? I still don't know what they did. There there we go. In a long tail. Uh, um, and I discovered a little bit of its hip bone and then the hip bones were so distinct I knew exactly what it was. And uh, they're, they're really cool animals. They're only about this big with stubby little arms and long, long legs and a long tail and they were feathered. Uh, really cool things that people think maybe dug in anthills because they had these big st stubby arms. Yeah, going back to all alvarosaurus. With very sharp needle-like teeth. I still don't know what they did. They're, they're mysterious animals, but they're, they're really, really cool. And the fact that I, that I found a piece of one that uh, I didn't get to name, but at least it's, it's some sort of new animal from Montana. That and he says he didn't get to name it. That was a conscious choice. John Hutchinson could have named this, but again, he appealed to the better angels of his nature. He acted more like what's his rank? Is it Commander Spock? I'm not a I'm not a, a trekker. Everybody, is it Commander Spock? He acted more like Spock than like uh, than like Kirk in this sense. Commander, thank you, Claire Burr. Yeah. Um, so John Hutchinson could have named this as a new dinosaur because scientists have egos, like Jack Horner was saying, and he didn't do it. He didn't do it. Um, and MLF says a trekker. I've, I've been told that trekker is the, the proper term. Trekkie apparently has pejorative overtones, which I am not trying to, not trying to deliver here, you know? Is it is it Trekker? Proper, says Claire Burr. Yeah. Danny's not a Trekker and doesn't really play video games. This I mean, is Laura I, Dern of Jurassic Park. True on both Park. counts. Digging up dinosaurs is hard, frustrating work. It takes months or years, so leave it to the professionals. And Popper Knight, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Blame Tasha Yar at her first Trek con. I thought she got killed by the smog monster on that planet uh by he he -dra. smog monster um anyway yeah 
She had words about it. Interesting, Claire. Interesting. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. And is that... Is that your partner there, Ren Melian? Popper Knight? Thank you, Popper Knight, for the following. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Anyway, my point is... Huge kudos to John Hutchinson for not naming this critter when a less scrupulous paleontologist might have done so. Because scientists have egos. And a littler dinosaur. Yeah. But all they had were big dinosaurs. And it comes down to a couple of things. First off, scientists have egos. And scientists like to name dinosaurs. RL has been nice for Melian. Like cool. It's awesome to have, to have a, own a couple here. Welcome, welcome. Named. And so... Yeah. And so every time they found something that looked a little different, they named it something different. Yep. And what happened, of course, is we ended up with a whole bunch of different dinosaurs. Yep. In 1975, a light went on in somebody's head. Dr. Peter Dodson at the University of Pennsylvania actually realized that uh, dinosaurs grew kind of like birds do, which is different than the way Something is different, grow. Ty. There you go, and cats. In fact, yeah. <laughs> he used the cassowary as an example, and it's kind of yeah. cool. I mean, if you look at the cassowary or any of the birds that have crests on their heads, they actually grow to about 80% adult size before the crest starts to grow. Now think about that. I mean, they, they're basically retaining their juvenile characteristics very late in what we call... What we call what? What do we call it, chat? Very late in what we call... Why isn't that... Hang on a minute. Why isn't that working here? Ontogeny, I don't know why it... Uh, maybe the sound alert is broken right now? Anyway, ontogeny. 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 So, alimentary yeah. cranial ontogeny is relative skull growth. Yeah. Okay. So you can see that if you actually found one that was 80% grown and you didn't know that it was going to grow up to a cassowary, you would yeah. think they were two different animals. Right? So, so this was a problem, and Peter Dotson pointed this out using some duckbill dinosaurs, a thing called Hypacrosaurus. And he showed that if you were to take a baby and an adult and make an average of what it should look like if it grew in sort of a linear fashion, it would have a crest about half the size of the adult. But the actual subadult, the 65%, had no crest at all. So this was interesting. Hmm. So this is, this is where people went astray again. I mean, if they had just taken that taken Peter Dodson's work and gone on with that, then we would have a lot less dinosaurs than we have. But scientists have egos. Yeah. They yeah. like to name things. That's and so true. they went on naming dinosaurs because they were different. Yep. Now, we have a way of actually testing to see whether a dinosaur or any animal is a young one or an older one. Yep, we call this histology. You gotta cut those bones open. See what they look like on the inside. Count the lags, the lines of arrested growth, the rings. Count the rings, as a Yankee fan would say, right? As a Yankees fan would say. And that's by And uh JN says, are ducks related to duck billed dinosaurs? Not closely, no. So ducks are kind of bird, and birds are a kind of theropod dinosaur. Let me let me show you what I mean here. Yeah. So Birds are up here on the, the family tree. So birds are related to two-legged, feathered, meat-eating dinosaurs. Duckbill dinosaurs are way over here. 
So the fact that ducks have got a duck bill and duck bill dinosaurs have got a duck bill, that's a coincidence. It doesn't actually show that they're closely related. Um, so yeah, a duck is more closely related to a velociraptor than it is to a duck bill dinosaur. Does that make sense? Yeah. As far as we can tell, all birds evolved from a single feathered, two-legged, meat-eating dinosaur. Um, there we go. I think I have a, a clip about this, don't I? Yeah. Except it's muted here. Let's go. There we go. Which the specific species a turkey is most likely descended from? Are you talking about like specific species of dinosaur? We're still not sure which species of dinosaur birds evolved from. We're still figuring that out. We don't have good enough fossils yet. We need to go out there and dig some more. But I'll tell you this. It's not like different kinds of birds evolved from different kinds of non-bird dinosaur. It seems like all birds evolved from a single dinosaur species at some point in like the middle Jurassic period, maybe. Yep. So there is one species of dinosaur that all birds evolved from. You know, first there was one species, and then maybe it split into two, and then those ones diversified, and you know how evolution works. Diversification, that's how it happens. Yeah. So, uh, I hope that makes sense to you right there. Yeah. Uh, and what did that dinosaur evolve from? From an earlier dinosaur, Spiky Pugwash, yeah. Yeah, and on and on and on down the line until you get to the first single-celled organism. Evolution is so cool, JN. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and Bearbolt says, what's the name of that flat-armored dinosaur with the club on its tail? There's a bunch of them, Bearbolt. You, what you're talking about are ankylosaurs. Yeah. These armored dinosaurs here. Some of them had clubs and some of them didn't on their tails. Yeah. The ankylosaurs. I actually helped dig up a brand new species of ankylosaur. One of the non-clubbed ones. But the ankylosauridae are the ones that did have clubs on their tails. Yeah. There we go. They possessed a distinctly domed and short snout, wedge-shaped osteoderms, armor plates, on their skull, scutes along their torso, and a tail club. And that tail club, oh man, you would not want to be on the receiving end of that thing. It could, it could probably knock your head off. Yeah, so these are ankylosaurs. Ankylosauridae is the family of the tail club ankylosaurs. There's a link there for you. Uh, Bearbold. There you go. Yeah. Pretty cool animals. I've got a, a skull of an ankylosaur right here. Let me, let me grab it for you. There we go. This is the skull, 3D printed, of Uoplocephalus. This is printed life-size. This skull itself is like, it's just, unlike most dinosaur skulls, which tend to be very airy, very like full of these beautiful fenestrae, these windows, full of air and everything. The skull of an ankylosaur is fused solid like this. Like, all of the skull bones are very, very well fused together, and that's where this group of animals gets its name. Ankylosauridae. That means the fused lizards. But in the serious game of paleontology, much larger mysteries still remain. And Waffle Maker, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologize. So yeah. Yeah. And no relation at all to an armadillo, Red Melian. No. So armadillos are mammals. 
They are way, 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 way far away from any dinosaur. Yeah. Um. I'm glad you asked. This is this is an important point. Here to go back to our phylogeny here. What is a dinosaur and what isn't? Thanks for the content. You've increased my interest for dinosaurs. That's some high praise there, Dino Wolf. I really appreciate that. Thank you for the nine months of support, Dino Wolf. That means a lot to me. Thank you, thank you. Here. So what is a dinosaur and what isn't? Well, dinosaurs start off right here. You might be wondering, like, what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur? It actually turns out to be at once more complicated and much, much, much more simple than you might imagine. In order to be a dinosaur, you have to have evolved from the ancestor of all the dinosaurs. The way that we classify living things in science is based on their ancestry. It's based on like a family tree. In order to belong to a certain group of, of organisms, you have to have evolved from the ancestor of those organisms. And so for dinosaurs, all dinosaurs evolved from the first dinosaur. The critter probably pretty similar to Eoraptor, about 235, maybe 240 million years ago. This is at the base of the dinosaur family tree. So if you evolve from this critter, you are, by definition, a dinosaur. That's how that works. That's why birds... Birds are birds, but birds are also dinosaurs, because they evolved from that dinosaur ancestor. You can trace their evolution back to the origin of the dinosaurs. That's why the pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, they're not dinosaurs. They're just outside of the dinosaur family tree. We think they actually evolved maybe before the first dinosaurs, so they're not dinosaurs. Mammals over here, like the armadillo, that's a kind of mammal. We're also a kind of mammal. Human beings are mammals, so are lions and tigers and bears. Camels and whales and shrews and bats are all mammals. They come from this branch. They're a kind of synapsid, so they are pretty distant from dinosaurs. Very distant from dinosaurs, in fact. So yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Yeah, and the pixie song. Yeah, isn't that great? Sweet and sauerkraut? Yeah. Yeah. And Legit Salvage says, When I learned that pterodactyls were not dinosaurs, it rocked my world to the core. Well, I mean, they're close to dinosaurs. They're very close. Look how close they are. They're both um, Ava Metatarsalian creatures. And they're both archosaurs. So pterosaurs are closer to dinosaurs than crocodiles are even though they're both archosaurs, but but they're not dinosaurs themselves. Pterosaurs are not dinosaurs. They're close. Close, but no cigar. Yeah. Anyway. And Sparky Pogger says the mammals with dinosaurs laid eggs, right? I mean, a lot of them did. But it's not because they lived at the same time as dinosaurs that they laid eggs. It's just that that Mesozoic mammals, um, like uh, multi-tuberculates, for instance, these little mammals, these guys that lived alongside the dinosaurs, these kind of rodent-like mammals that were not rodents, um, they're before the rodents. They had these really cool fourth premolars like that. This big honking tooth inside the mouth that they could like shear with. They could like slice open bugs and stuff with it. Um, these guys probably laid eggs. Science. What science ever done for us? TV off. Maple takes. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome, welcome. And here's an interesting take here too. <laughs> Uh, yeah, multi-tuberculates. So this is a group of mammals that were all over the place during the, the age of the dinosaurs, and they probably laid eggs. Um, 
these little mammaly guys, these multis as we call them, they probably laid eggs. But this group went extinct. Not too long after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, yeah, yeah, the mammals that laid eggs, they didn't do super well after the extinction of the dinosaurs. And so all the mammals that we have left are mostly mammals that don't lay eggs. Although the platypus and the echidna are like the, the two big examples of egg-laying mammals that are still around today. There you go. Uh, JN, yeah. Yeah, there you go. And Loki says, so early humans laid eggs. No, humans do not belong to that group. Humans are placental mammals. Here. Go back to our uh, tree of life here. Let's go to the mammals on our tree of life. And Handy Danny says, monotremes represent yes. Yeah. So monotremes used to be much more common. So uh, here's amniotes, here's mammals. So the first group, I'm gonna branch off mammals, one of the most basal of the groups are the monotremes, the egg-laying mammals like platypus and echidnas. But there's only like five species of them left in the entire world. All the rest of the mammals are what we call therian mammals that give birth to live young. And even among them, there's some interesting ones like the marsupials, which raise their young in a pouch. There's like 300 species of them around today. But then we get to the other mammals, the placental mammals, who have a placenta. And there's like 4,700 species of them. It's a lot. These are the dominant mammals on planet Earth today. On planet Earth or any other planet, to my knowledge. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? So humans are a part of placental mammals. We are within this group. Let's jump to Homo sapiens. Yeah. There's us over there. In our fancy sm space suits. We think we're so big, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but there we are among the great apes. Really disappointing that we're the we're the only one of the great apes that's not endangered right now. It's because of us, by the way. We've ruined it for all of our relatives. All of our closest relatives are endangered, and that's because of us. Ah, uh, shame on us, you know? Yeah. Anyway, chimps and bonobos. Orangutans and gorillas. They're all not doing so hot, and that's because of us, you know? We're the awful family member at the Thanksgiving table. Yeah. Yeah. And we might have been endangering ourselves in the last 400 years. Yeah, you know, there's no there's no guarantee that we're going to still be around for another 400 years either. We, have, we might be messing things up too badly. We, we, might, we might go extinct. Who knows? You know? Gotta be careful. Yeah. The guilty ape, says SVR can yeah. <laughs> Uh. Anyway. Yeah. Um. You believe in us? I believe in us too, sweet and sour cry. You know, to go back to... This is actually a, a more pessimistic vision of the future. Mystery Science Theater 3000. Uh, I really prefer to... Uh, I really prefer to have a more optimistic vision of the future of humanity. One outlined in, uh, in media such as... Star Trek, you know? This is the thing, is that we as human beings, we've got a choice right now, right here, right now. This is, this is an inflection point for the future of humanity. We could have 
a Star Trek future in which we band together and decide that we're going to care for everybody, not just for the ultra wealthy. We're going to engineer society to make sure that not only do we exist long into the future, centuries past, but we take care of everybody and the natural world. We could do that or or we can take another route. We can take the Mad Max route where society will collapse in the future. The, you know, the natural biome, we will continue to exploit Earth's resources to the point where things just collapse to make a few pe people ultra, ultra wealthy, and then it's life is brutish, miserable, and short for the rest of us. You know? Please no Mad Max says sweet and sauerkraut. Yeah. Claire Burr seems gung ho for that Mad Max feature. Oh, no, Claire Burr, no, no. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But yeah. Red Melian says water world if we keep losing glacial ice. We'll never have the whole world submerged. I mean, there was a time in Earth history when, uh, when there was no ice on our planet and our planet looked largely like this. So we still had lots of dry land, but like, you know, no more Florida. Almost no more Texas. No more North or South Dakota, Nebraska, or Kansas, or Oklahoma. Almost no more California. And etc. No more Alberta or Saskatchewan. Yeah, Europe was a series of islands in a, a shallow sea like this. Yeah. Um, we might end up with something like this again if we manage to melt all of the earth on Earth's... Uh, all of the wa the ice on Earth's surface, excuse me. This is what happens when you have massive sea level rise. But we've never had the entire Earth submerged by water. That's just never happened. So yeah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, not as many people want to live in the oceans. <laughs> Oh boy, yeah. I, I'm willing to guess that probably most people in the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, probably the majority of people didn't know that this was submerged during the Cretaceous. That's not why they live here now. But yeah, yeah. S.B. Harkin says Ohio is there. It is true. Yeah, Ohio is. Uh, Unironically, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Why the Rust Belt may soon become the climate migration belt. You can't just declare yourself a climate refuge, you know, you better work and earn it. Um, that's the thing, is that, like, as sea levels continue to rise and temperatures increase around the Earth... I mean, here, take take a look at this. Would you believe me if I said that one of the best places to escape climate change is Cleveland, Ohio? Cleveland! Let me... And, yeah, Cleveland, of course, Cleveland is... is one of the greatest places in the world, you know? Um... Uh, yeah, I mean, we've all... We've all seen 30 Rock, right? You know? Anyway, um... Yeah, yeah. Here's the thing, though. That was all very jokey. Cleveland, Cleveland. I've been to Cleveland. I, I don't know. I can tell you that when I went to the Natural History Museum in Cleveland, it was closed for renovations for the most part. So, anyway. They do have... They do have, of course, the Cleveland Skull of Nano Tyrannus, a.k.a. Juvenile Tyrannosaurus. But here, check Would this out. Would you believe me if I said that one of the best places to escape climate change is Cleveland, Ohio? Yeah, yeah. I know. 
Let me tell you why. When it seems like there's a forest fire, drought, or hurricane wherever you turn in the United States, where would you go to be as safe as possible in the future from these growing climate change threats? Yep. Whoa, 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 doomerism alert. Here on my channel, posting doomer <laughs> comments is illegal. I truly believe that whatever climate change does, we have smart and driven people that will always strive to make changes necessary for their home cities to be more resilient. Hopefully. I most cities are fixable and salvageable, but some require enormous amount of work compared to others. Yeah, yes. shoot like Miami. There might be a few that will have to be abandoned in the future, but I still think that we'll get through this together. Anyway. Pittsburgh is a city located in western Pennsylvania in the Allegheny. And Dame Karen says, how about we fix rather than escape? That's the idea here. That's exactly the idea, Dame Karen. This is a more optimistic view of this kind of thing, you know? Originally, yeah. its existence is largely based on the abundance of iron ore and coal nearby, making Pittsburgh one of the largest producers of steel in the 1800s and early Pittsburgh? 1900s. Pittsburgh? Why are we talking about Pittsburgh? Also, one of the biggest producers of rich fucks and labor violations. Oh, Pittsburgh hang on. has a downtown core Come on. peninsula with Language. neighborhoods across both Language. the surrounding rivers, and some on the cliffs that face the rivers. And on the other hand, we have the original home of the Seminole peoples. Tampa, Florida was incorporated after the Civil War in 1887. Home there to you go, Bart Bearbold, yeah. It stayed yeah. relatively small as a city until after World War II. Because of tourism and with the growth of the Sun Belt, Tampa grew substantially in the late 1900s. Tampa's geography consists of a downtown sprawling into multiple peninsulas and being surrounded by outstretched suburbs built into the Florida swamps. As you can tell, these are very different cities. Wetlands. We call them wetlands, not swamps. Location. Wetlands. Pittsburgh is located in the Allegheny Mountains, but these mountains are part of a larger Americana legend, the Rust Belt. The Rust Belt is a series of cities stretching from Minneapolis to upstate New York. Hmm. And the Rust adjective comes from the fact that most of these cities are past their prime. And the mm. prime was the era of American industry and might. The Rust Belt's geography is mostly due to these cities being prime transportation routes, either from water or rail. Since most of these cities needed water access, they were founded on the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are a series of some of the largest Interesting diagonal. Lakes okay, in the world, okay. so large that they're often treated by sailors like they're sailing on the ocean. Yeah. And stories about they're basically inland the seas, is the Great Lakes. part of American folklore and culture, such as the story of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. Yeah. And now comes the important part for climate change. The Great Lakes not only allow for access to fresh water to be easy and reliable, but they also moderate the weather. The Rust Belt's location in North... And Cast the Dreamer says the Great Lakes have Coast Guard ships in them? Well, a lot of lakes have Coast Guard ships in them. Lake Tahoe here in California and Nevada has Coast Guard ships in it. Um, I think Fort Peck Lake in Montana, Flathead Lake, might have Coast Guard ships as well. So that's not, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure the Great Lakes have many more Coast Guard ships, but yeah, those are basically like inland seas. The Great Lakes are enormous. will also prevent it from yeah. getting too hot. Most of the cities are in relatively cool areas, and the Appalachian yeah. Mountains and the Great Plains generally protect these cities from other weather events, too. The only menace to these cities is snowstorms and nor'easters. Because of the snowstorms and cold winters, there's been an unfortunate shift from places like the Rust Belt to southern cities in the last 40 years. Oh boy, but here, as global temperatures continue to rise, things are going to get hotter and hotter and hotter in the Sun Belt, and soon, shoot, in some of these cities, like, things are not going to go well during, like, the enormous heat waves that are that are coming but a portion of these welcome to roast town there you go bear bolt yeah experience the hostile nature of climate change places like tampa will suffer the most with both increased storm activity and rising sea levels yeah. and many that live there will look for refuge in other places that are climate havens like the rust belt ironically some of the people that move south will move back north again to the places that they originally left behind to avoid dealing with constant weather related problems 
Yep. Yeah. Diagonal says, I have friends in Tucson who keep oven mitts in their car for driving in summer. That is nuts. I mean, that your steering wheel would just get so hot you wouldn't be able to touch it with your hands? Ugh. Yeah. Yowza. Yeah. Always families in Phoenix. Yeah. Red Melian. Yeah. Yeah. I keep hand towels. Oven mitts are a great idea, says Lenina. Oh, boy. Yeah. Ugh. Anyway, yeah. I'll give you a link to this video if you want to watch the rest of it, but we're going to continue on with our dinosaur ontogeny video. So let's do that, and let's get rid of some of these other tabs here. Which, I don't even know where that video went. Shoot. Um, gosh darn it. Let's see. Here we are. Let's find that spot again. You used the cassowary as an example. So we saw this already? So they, yeah. Basically retaining their juvenile characteristics very late into what we call ontogeny. So allometric cranial ontogeny is relative skull growth. Okay? So you can see that if you ontogeny. actually found one that was 80% grown. Now it's working. And you didn't know. Now the sound alerts are working. I don't know why they weren't working earlier, Claire Burr. Sorry about that. Yeah, it works again. No, that it was going to grow up to a castle. Ontogeny. You would think they were two different animals. Dirter. Right? So, so this was a problem, and Peter Dotson pointed this out. Ontogeny. Using some duckbill dinosaurs, a thing called Hypacrosaurus. And yeah. Said, if you were to take a baby and an adult and make an average of what it should look like if it grew in sort of a linear fashion. Blue is cheap. It would have a crest about half the size of the adult. But the actual sub-adult, the 65%, had no crest at all. Yeah, so this was interesting. interesting. So this Very is, interesting. This is the point is that when dinosaurs are growing, sometimes they don't develop their crests or horns or stuff like that until they're like 70% grown or maybe more they might reach almost their adult size before actually developing that kind of like ornamentation that the full-fledged adults this have. is where people went astray again i mean if they had just taken that taken peter dotson's work and gone on with that then we would have a lot less dinosaurs than we have yeah but Scientists have egos. They like to name things. Yep. And so they went on naming the dinosaurs because they were different. Now, we have a way of actually testing to see whether a dinosaur or any animal is a young one or an older one. And that's yep. by actually cutting into their bones. And Will62 says late sexual maturity. It seems like these dinosaurs were actually sexually mature before they reached their full adult size. Um, Sarah Werning had a really, really good talk about this, about, like, teen pregnancy in dinosaurs, like Tenontosaurus, um, where they can reproduce before they actually reach their full adult size. Which is really interesting. So that's not what's going on here, yeah. But cutting yeah. into the bones of a dinosaur is... Uh hard to do as you can imagine because museums bones are precious right you go into a museum and they take really good care of them they we try to yeah foam yeah. Little containers and i mean it's they're very well taken care of they don't like it if you come in and want to saw them open and look inside so. yeah <laughs> and wow they just kept growing yeah will six two well they keep growing until a certain size and then they stop. We don't know of any dinosaurs that just kept growing and growing and growing until they died. Like, they reach a certain size and then they stop growing. But sexual maturity is far before that, that adult size, that full adult size. And so that's one way that dinosaurs are different from, say, like, modern mammals or even modern reptiles, you know? Yeah. 
They don't normally let you do that, but I have a museum and I collect dinosaurs and I can saw mine open, so that's what I do. <laughs> yep. So, if you cut open a little hey, dinosaur, Chewie, welcome, welcome. it's Good very spongy inside, like A. Yep. And if you cut into an older dinosaur, it's very yeah. massive. It's very, I mean, you can, you can very tell solid. it's mature bone, so it's real easy yeah. to tell them apart. So, what I want to do is show you these in North America, in the northern plains of the United States and the southern plains of Alberta and Saskatchewan, there's this unit of rock called the Hell Creek Formation. That this is what we were talking about yesterday. The last dinosaurs that lived on Earth. And there are 12 of them that everyone recognizes. I mean, there are 12. Nowadays, we actually have more. There were like, there was like four of these that were just named in the, the past 12 months. Um, we've got a new pachycep two new pachycephalosaurs. We've got uh, a new oviraptorosaur just published a few days ago. Um, you know, a bunch of other dinosaurs. So, like the the number of Hell Creek dinosaurs has definitely grown, but some of these are definitely just juveniles of other dinosaurs. So, like here is that same tally afterward. Anata Titan. We can say that this animal almost certainly is just a juvenile, or excuse me, like a fully adult uh, Edmontosaurus. Draco Rex and Stygimolox seem to be juvenile Pachycephalosaurus. Um, Nano Tyrannus. If you talk to most dinosaur paleontologists, they'll agree, agree that it's just a juvenile Tyrannosaurus, although this is still very controversial. There are some paleontologists who say that Nano Tyrannus is. Different dinosaur than Tyrannosaurus. Anyway, but this is what we call uh, synonymy through ontogeny. That these are just the same dinosaurs at different ontogenetic growth stages. And this is a really, really important thing to understand. You know? Yeah. And why is it called Hell Creek? Because uh, sometimes it's kind of an unpleasant place, Dame Karen. I think Barnum Brown may have named it. Um, why did Barnum Brown, uh, name it Hell Creek? What's in a name? Barnum Brown's Hell Creek location and Hell Creek formation observations. Uh, let's take a look at that. So Hell Creek is, a uh, the Hell Creek Formation is an accumulation of rocks from the latest Cretaceous of North America. And Barnum Brown, the guy who discovered Tyrannosaurus. Oh, Bug Catcher, thank you for the follow. Had a sheep there, too. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Yeah. In the field, a geologist uses whatever map is available. Time passes. Scientists revisit the same area and assume the names of features have remained the same, which is not always the case. Barnum Brown named the Hell Creek Formation in 1907 for exposures on Hell Creek, which is a place in Montana, and its tributaries in northeast Montana. Brown and others worked to start... Uh, worked the strata cropping out along the drainage in the early 1900s and may have identified the tributaries of the Hell Creek differently than labeled on maps used today. Um, let's see if we can find the part where... Oh, this is just the abstract? Oh, shoot. Never mind. I thought this would be the full paper. Ugh. I guess this is from the poster session. But anyway... There's this wonderful poetic description that Barnum Brown wrote of Hell Creek, and it's like... He actually wrote two descriptions. One of them was like, oh, this is the, the most wonderful place I've ever been. It is teeming with fossils. What a paradise this is. And then he came back at a different time of year, and he says, this is absolutely infernal. There's mosquitoes and biting flies and gnats. The, the heat is absolutely hellish. What an, an absolutely 
abysmal, infernal place. So yeah, yeah. You hate biting flies, cast the dreamer. Yeah, I don't know if anybody's a huge fan of biting flies. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, I gotta find that original paper where it's got that uh, that description of why he calls it Hell Creek, that very poetic description. But I don't have it right now. So yeah. Anyway, holy cow, it's seven o'clock already? Well, shoot. I've been streaming for more than five hours at this point. And we just had an ad crop up. We're gonna wrap up in a little bit. Don't go away just yet though, chat. Do not go away. We're gonna raid into somebody else doing some science here on Twitch, hopefully. Bearbolt says, are there unexplored or inaccessible places on Earth that paleontologists believe could have a wealth of fossils? Absolutely, Bearbolt. Yeah. Places like the Arabian Peninsula? You know, Saudi Arabia and, and surrounding environs? Uh, Siberia and Russia and surrounding areas with exposed rock. Antarctica, we know is full of fossils. And we've only been able to get a few from certain places where the rock is exposed. Yeah, we definitely, we definitely know of places where there will be more fossils and we just haven't been able to find them yet. So yeah. And Red Melian says, what do you think of the new Jurassic World 4 movie coming out? Are you a fan of the series or hate it? I... I'm fond of the original Jurassic Park films. Jurassic World, the first one of that series that came out in 2015, I found very frustrating, and they only get worse from there. Oh, boy. Jurassic World 3. Jurassic World... Uh, Kingdom of Dominoes or whatever it was called. Um, I thought was abysmal. It was one of the worst movies I've ever seen in the theater. It was so bad. Um, yeah. Let's hope the next one is better. I guess they have a chance for a reboot or a change of pace. Apparently David Kep, who was the screenwriter on the first Jurassic Park film, uh, he is the screenwriter, apparently, so let's hope it's gonna be better. We'll see. So, yeah. Um. Jurassic World Electric Boogaloo. Yeah, there you go, HD. Let's hope it's better. But anyway, we can talk more about that tomorrow if you'd like to. For right now, let's wrap things up. Let's put a mammal here under our credits. Uh, and, uh, let's see who else is live on Twitch right now that we might raid into them. Um, let's see. Oh, Melissa in Denial is on right now. She is live. She is not a paleontologist, but she's an archaeologist and an Egyptologist. Let's go see what she's up to. Raid. Melissa in denial. She's playing Lego Indiana Jones here. We'll go see what she's up to. Um, everybody, thank you for a wonderful stream today. To everyone being named here in the credits, I appreciate you more than you know. Followers and cheerers, subscribers and resubscribers, gifters, and moderators, raiders, and chatters and lurkers. Thank you all for making this a fun stream. I hope you had a good time today. I hope you learned something. I hope you are enthusiastic about learning a more learning more about you know this incredible planet that we live on and its rich and fascinating history bugcatcher says thanks glad to have found this stream and i will be streaming again tomorrow like i do every weekday bugcatcher talking about fossil science and what it means to our everyday lives 
what it means to who we are and what we know, all that good stuff. Doing that more tomorrow. Let's go check out Melissa and Melissa in Denial. I'll see you there, everybody. Take care.